the Joint City Council and Budget Committee work session this evening, October 12th, 2021. I welcome members of the City Council, the Budget Committee, and others that are joining us this evening. Um, I, I'll just let you know we received a uh, text from uh, Council President Drabkin, who is in the middle of crush and may not make it to portions of the work session, but will be at our regular session this evening. And with that, uh, we will this evening in our first work session topic, be going over the American Rescue Plan, ARPA, and the city's allocation as part of the state and local fiscal recovery funds, SL, uh, F R. Uh, F. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Finance Director Jennifer. Go ahead, and uh, you sent some slides out, and I'm sure you're going to be using those this evening, but uh, we'll move forward. Go ahead, Jennifer. Yeah, hi. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm so, so happy to see so many members of the Budget Committee online um, for this really um, important topic that we've all been um, waiting several months to get to, um, talking about our allocation of the American Rescue Plan Act dollars. So um, I'm going to actually turn this over to Jeff, um, and he will kind of give us um, a grounding in what we're doing this evening. And um, Amanda actually took the reins and leadership in terms of guiding this through the, um, the staff uh, recommendation phase of the project. So she'll likely um, be talking with you more. So I'm definitely here for questions or what have you, but um, really excited to hand this over and listen in on your discussion. So. Thank you, Jennifer. Go ahead, Jeff. Thank you, Mayor, members of the Council and Budget Committee. Uh, again, want to thank Jennifer and Amanda in particular, but the whole executive team as with the rest of the process that we've been working through with you all over the last <clears throat> several months. This really has been a team effort. Um, I, well, Claudia, I'm wondering if you can run the slideshow for me. Can you do that? We got caught up very surprised. Sorry about that, Claudia. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, thank you, Claudia. Uh, go ahead and uh, um, go to the next slide. This is a brief roadmap for uh, what we'll be doing tonight. Uh, we're going to do a little bit of a retrospective of how we got here. Um, we'll spend time um, going over the um, significant um, uh, items and prioritizations that staff presented to you. Uh, we'll spend what we hope will be most of the time uh, in council and budget committee discussion with your observations and or questions. Uh, and, and we'll look forward to uh, wrapping up next steps at the end of the process. So next slide, just, just a reminder. And again, this is mostly for the public record and maybe for folks who haven't joined us um, consistently throughout the process. Uh, but in March of 2021, the Federal um, uh, Recovery Act became law. It was about a $2 trillion funding package, and um, you'll see how it's broken up in terms of uh, both the overall act and how uh, funds were allocated to our local partner jurisdictions. Um, we've had two prior work sessions on the topic, and uh, we'll uh, be presenting some information um, in a few minutes about the detailed uh, project investment requests that have been put together and, and presented to the council in the packet earlier. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just again, a, a, bit, a little bit of a review on uh, uh, where we started this uh, process in the spring and how we have been uh, moving forward. Our goal has been to uh, bring this issue to the Council and Budget Committee for uh, recommendation and direction in October, and we are at that point. Um, there's nothing magic about that. In fact, if the uh, Council and the Budget Committee feel like you need additional information prior to uh, moving forward on the issue, that's, that's what part of tonight's meeting is about. Um, so before uh, we start to uh, go over the kind of the high level 
um, summary on attachment A, which is the project uh, request, um, let me just set um, a little additional context. Um, you know, this is a this is a larger list um, than uh, could possibly be funded with this round of ARPA, and there are a couple of reasons. One is that we have a lot of needs that are um, we think eligible for uh, federal support through this program, and rather than restrict the list, uh, we felt like it was uh, better to sort of show the whole field of play, if you will, um, as as we work our way through deliberations and discussions. Uh, there is also, um, many believe, a uh, high likelihood that there will be a second round of ARPA funding at some point in the next year or two from the federal government. And if that's the case, the anticipation is the rules would be very much the same, uh, if not identical, and there would just be additional funds. And so setting uh, priorities that are kind of above and beyond the resources that are immediately available to us uh, may make some sense in the context of a, a, a future funding opportunity. And in addition to that, uh, we think that there may be state programs, some funded by ARPA, uh, that these projects um, would be eligible for as we move them through their, their lifespan. Uh, and there may be additional infrastructure funds or other federal grant programs that some of the projects on this list can qualify for. And it could be that by spending some initial ARPA funds on these projects, we would ready them for uh, a more competitive process or potentially an opportunity for earmarks. Um, in addition, um, all of these ARPA projects, whether they're on the list now or they're added to the list by the Council and the Budget Committee, will come back to the Council as part of uh, one or more supplemental budget processes, which will, as, as all of our supplemental budget processes do, include public notice and an opportunity for public comment and more detail than you have available to you tonight. So we're not expecting you to simply uh, make final decisions based on the summary information that you have, but we'll be refining um, um, the, the details as we move forward. Um, just to let you know, uh, there are a couple of things on the list that are sort of already uh, moving a little bit, um, and some of the dollars that um, we're refining even um, even today aren't, aren't reflected in detail in the uh, project list that you have in front of you. I'm, I wanna mention two of them specifically. Uh, one is the opportunity to fund all or a part of the Parks and Open Space Master Plan. Uh, we're refining those numbers to um, show you how we could potentially move the master plan forward with partial ARPA support instead of uh, entire support from ARPA. And you'll also see a relatively late ad. We got a request from McNinville Water and Light um, to assist with some um, uh, uh, water infrastructure work in and around the community. Um, right now, the, the, full, the full amount of the request um, that Water and Light presented to us is for both engineering work as well as for right-of-way acquisition. Um, it's staff's perspective that engineering work uh, is a more appropriate use of our ARPA funds than property acquisition. Um, the project has not moved forward uh, far enough to really delineate how much of those funds may be related to property acquisition as opposed to engineering. And in addition, um, uh, Water and Light has also forwarded the same project to Yamhill County for potential support with the county's ARPA funds. And so if this is a project that the Council and the Budget Committee are interested in, um, our staff suggestion would be to focus a little bit less on the, um, on the amount and more on what you would want the money to go for. And we would suggest a, a portion of engineering depending on other partnerships and, and final cost estimates and, and, not, and not utilize the funds for property acquisition. Uh, one reason is property acquisition can be really expensive and it's also not clear from the project whether um, any or all of that property that might be acquired for right of way is even inside the city limits. Um, the other um, the other suggestion or the other, I guess, context to think about this is that the items in the priority groups uh, that has been presented to the council and the budget committee will be refined once we get some direction from you about whether or not you think these are the right projects. Um, we would I, I add additional service um, detail, um, implementation plans, more, um, more detail uh, of cost implications, uh, both in terms of uh, sort of immediate needs and as the project would move forward. Uh, in addition, uh, one last final sort of grounding issue is that some of the priorities uh, reflect some council priorities and, and some of the significant needs that we've talked about in the core services. Um, some a couple of specific examples would be the emergency management plan uh, and the facilities maintenance plan. Um, in our view, there are important long-term projects that are both 
um, a focus of the council and the budget committee for service expansion through additional revenue as well as being ARPA eligible. And some of those programs, it may make sense to jumpstart those programs initially using ARPA funds rather than waiting a full fiscal year or more um, to be able to, to move them forward. And emergency management and facilities maintenance are two of those um, concepts. Emergency, a formal emergency management plan has been on the council's list of priorities for the, at least the last two years. And, uh, and a focused facility uh, maintenance program has been identified as a gap uh, in the organization for several budget years as well. And as we move through the budget process next year, we provide additional detailed plans and, uh, and, and again, dollar estimates for how ARPA would or wouldn't be used. In both of those cases, we would anticipate hiring staff people to begin the planning of those projects and utilize ARPA funds for that initial hire, uh, but probably not for a full year, maybe not even until we get, maybe only until we get to the beginning of next fiscal year. But again, those are some of the details that we'll present to you if, if you'd like to see additional information. Uh, with that, uh, I'll ask you to go ahead and uh, go to the next slide. We ultimately provided um, uh, summary information on 53 uh, project investment requests, the uh, total far outstrips the amount, uh, uh, the high end total. Um, we also heard from the council and the budget committee um, that um, there were a number of categories you wanted us to, to consider. So we really put these into three categories. One, a high priority recommending uh, receiving initial um, funding, uh, medium priority, uh, potential funding if available, and then potential future investment uh, was just not knowing how projects could evolve or how uh, other funds might become available. We didn't think there was necessarily anything on the list that wasn't worthy of consideration. That's why we didn't delete anything, uh, but we also didn't prioritize much beyond the point where we felt like we would utilize most or all of our initial ARPA um, allocation. Next slide, please. Uh, we categorized each of um, the projects. Uh, what we heard from the Council and Budget Committee in earlier conversations is that you were particularly interested in projects that were either innovative and would high, have high impact, uh, would have some immediate impact on, on the community, sort of be outwardly facing, and also identify uh, projects that uh, would bring etern internal efficiency and effectiveness to the organization and really limit future carrying costs. We didn't use those categories when setting the priorities. We set the priorities based on um, your eligibility criteria, the investment principles that you adopted as a group, uh, and the city's values and priorities in the strategic plan. Once, once we set the priority, then we applied each, um, then we identified which category we thought each project best fit into. Uh, next slide, please. We ended up with um, 20 uh, total, total high priority projects um, that were split across all three categories. You see the current range, and again, that range is subject to change. Uh, we've, we've seen projects uh, that have been presented to you by your affordable housing um, committee, the um, Economic um, Vitality Leadership Council, and MAC, Water and Light, and we've included those uh, for your consideration. Next slide. A uh, couple of uh, graphic versions on how to look at the uh, high priority uh, projects, uh, both the low range and the high range. It's, it just shows them split across the three categories. Uh, again, innovative high impact projects, uh, immediate impact community projects, and internal efficiency and effectiveness. Next slide. Um, in the medium category, we ended up with um, 10 projects. Um, you can see the total cost project range there. Again, they ended up being split across all three of the categories. Next slide. And there's a graphic representation of, of how um, those medium range priorities um, are, uh, both at the high and low range allocated across the, the three uh, project categories. Next slide, please. So we presented to you um, the, all, uh, all of the potential future investment projects. Uh, again, uh, we don't necessarily expect immediate access to uh, these federal funds, but we felt like it was important to retain uh, for, for future needs, either um, because there are important projects to move ahead for the community or because there might be additional or alternative federal funding available at some point. Next slide. <clears throat> And so uh, the first thing we'd like to spend some time doing tonight is, is talking about the specific details in attachment A, which is the project list, um, getting your questions, um, comments, 
um, areas where you'd like to see uh, revisions or additions. And um, it might be better at this point, um, Claudia, if you unshare screen so that the mayor can sort of better facilitate the conversation. Um, let me turn first to Jennifer and Amanda to see if either of them have either additions, clarifications, or corrections they'd like to add. None for me, Jeff, thanks. No, that, that was great. Um, thanks so much for presenting it and putting together all the lists. So now the fun decisions, the fun discussion. Okay, have at it. Well, Jeff has asked us to look at uh, attachment A and that's a part of your packet. Uh, and um, and uh, a, a part of that, uh, that uh, agenda would be the, the 20 high, high priority items. Uh, we can go outside of that, but I'll just kind of open it up uh, to those that might on the budget committee and the council that might uh, have, uh, want to start a discussion or have a, a thought. So I'll go ahead anyone that would like to, to start us out. or even general comments as to uh, as we've done our studying and preparation. Uh, Kelly? I see Zach has his electronic oh. uh, hand up at the bottom here. Okay. I'm, not sure who, I'm not sure who was first, just to let you know there's two. Maybe years. Zach was first. Okay, Zach. Uh, but I'll, I'll defer to, for questions, um, and not take the lion's share on time. I just wanted to start by saying, just out of an abundance of caution, remind everyone, I don't think this is a surprise, but given that they're on the list too, my lovely wife works for the city of McMinnville and the library, and I just want to, I don't think that'll affect my decision-making ability, but I just, again, out of an abundance of caution, want to make that known. Thank you, Zach, for that disclosure. Okay, let's go to Kelly first. I, I just wanted to make a comment that, uh, personally, I very much like the way this is laid out and the prioritization uh, pretty much gives something good for everybody. Um, so my overall feeling is I, I like the organization of it, but I'm putting that out there for the rest to comment on. Thank you, Kelly. Other comments? Uh, Adam? Yeah, I wanted to dive a little deeper into uh, the million dollars for water and light. I, from my understanding, they're pretty well funded on their own. So I don't, I'm just having a hard time grasping why we're cutting off a million dollars from other priorities we could have in the city. Jeff, do you want to do that? Or so you my initial reaction is, is if it was simply a million dollars, take it or leave it, it wouldn't, I, from my perspective, I don't think it would be on the list. I think there's some value in considering uh, an important infrastructure project, especially focused on the Highway 18 corridor, where we're likely to invest other ARPA or maybe other city dollars. Um, you know, as you look at the possibility of the of the Innovation Center moving forward, uh, again, I think we need to have more details on um, how much of that million dollars is actually engineering, which I think is the appropriate potential use of that fund, uh, those funds. And I think we also need to see how it plays out with. Uh, with the possibility of Yamhill County. If, if we could put some engineering funds in and that would help leverage ARPA funds uh, from Yamhill County, that might be a, 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 an additional justification for moving the project forward. I think we need more information though before we commit to any specific details on that project from a staff perspective. And it, of course the you know, council prerogative is to, is to either prioritize it or not. And, and uh, we, would be, we would deliver that message as well if necessary. Does that answer um, your question, Adam? Yeah, it does to an extent. I just, yeah, I'm more of like from the, does that project not move forward if we don't fund a million dollars or whatever the engineering bill is for that? And I just, I don't feel from water and like financial point of view, like they're going to move forward with it regardless. If it's going to generate money for them, they're going to go forward with it. Do you have perspective on that project, Mayor? Well, again, just to bring everyone up to speed, what we're looking at is um, um, Mac Water and Light has spent tremendous dollars already on uh, uh, water rights out of the Willamette River, and it would become a redundant source of, of, uh, of water source for McMinnville. It falls really into the categories that the federal government had talked about 
in water, but it also really runs into emergency management from a perspective. If we were to have a sizable earthquake, we may not have water in McMinnville uh, coming off the uh, off uh, the Nestucca area off the uh, off the mountain, and this. This redundant system would be we've purchased land, we've purchased the rights, we've put millions of dollars into this process as we speak, and it it protects the city with that redundancy. And secondarily, it becomes the opportunity to maybe build out a, um, a regional a facility that could be expanded at a later date. All those things, you know, Mac Water and Light are really focused around their customer base, which is the city of McMindale. So I don't know if that gives you any more clarification, Adam, or some some thoughts from that perspective. I, I appreciate the additional context, but still, uh, I don't know if I could get behind supporting that on this list. No, I think, for, you know, what I take from Councillor Garvin's comments is at the very least, we want to get some more refined information from Water and Light about the, you know, how this, how this um, money would either um, allow the project to move forward or leverage additional funds um, and, and get a lot more clarity than, than we have right now. Did you, did that answer your questions, Adam? Uh, yeah, if we could get some additional clarity before we move forward with anything related to that, that would definitely definitely help. Thanks. We'll we'll give that back to Jeff and staff to, and I know Jeff's been talking to to John Dietz on that. Uh, my my next one, well, I guess it was technically before the water and light one, but uh, I don't doubt that our park fleet is uh, towards the end of life, but. What is 370 to 400 grand? How is that a game changer for the, the park maintenance fleet? And does, how much capacity does that increase versus what we have right now? I think that's number six on, on this investment list. Thanks, Adam. Um, David Renshaw is on the line. So David, if I could ask you to uh, at least uh, initially address the counselor's question. Sure. What it does, Adam, is it, it takes our fleet from a, a situation where we're in the run to failure mode and we have multiple units that are not reliable. So, it, so we spend an enormous amount of time um, making those repairs instead of operating and that, that, that applies to mowers or trucks or trailers or different elements of our fleet. The, the reality is we just have not had the opportunity to invest in that fleet and this, this certainly would allow us to um, to do that, to, to reinvest in, in, in those units, and would just puts us in a better position to go out and do our jobs um, and spend less time on downtime and less time on fleet maintenance. And David, does it, I mean, are we replacing like a couple large, huge mowers, or are we replacing all the small equipment in one service truck, or? What, what, what would we do? Yeah, what we would be doing is we would be replacing the bulk of our utility truck fleet. Most of those trucks are, are pre-2000. Um, we'd probably be replacing at least one to two mowers. Um, probably be looking at adding a chipper. One thing we've talked about adding, we found during the ice storm that, that the not, not having a chipper was a huge uh, impediment. Um, that sort of, that piece of equipment specifically allows us to deal with down trees and it really reduces the amount of cycle time we have in terms of hauling debris. Instead of hauling brush to the um, recycle yard, we can hire haul chips, or we can oftentimes just place them in the park itself. So it's it's definitely it's a it's a kind of a of a effort to revitalize the fleet from the bottom up. So it would apply to a number of different types of units. Okay, and is this are we buying all new equipment, or is this we're buying old ODOT trucks again, or? No, um, quite honestly, I, I'm, there's some pieces of equipment that I would almost always buy new. I'd, I'd almost, almost buy a, a mower new just because I don't want to buy someone else's problems. I, 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 I am not um, afraid to look at used utility trucks, but sometimes, you know, particularly some of the stuff we've got from Water Light over the years, I, I think there's a community value to doing that. Um, so it would be kind of be a, a, a mixed bag. 
we certainly don't have the emergency um, element in parks that we have in streets, but anything that we might use in the parks fleet in an emergency situation, we would typically buy new because I want that um, reliability. Um, yeah, totally. And so, oh, yeah. and, 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 uh, and then obviously anything that we can get that helps us give some reliability with the street fleet as well. Um, because that creates redundancy as well, which is really important in emergency work. So I hope that answers your questions. Yeah, it does. Thank you. Great. Thank you, sir. Any other questions, Adam? Uh, I do, but I'll let some others go first. Okay. Uh, let's go to Councillor uh, Gary, Zach. Thanks. I see a long queue of hands, so I'll just be quick and respond to one, the main one of Adams that I wanted to jump in on. Uh, it was the McMinnville Water and Light. I would too second the need more information and specifics before putting before moving forward with investing in that, and and as such, so we can move the other priorities on. At this point, I would say take that one off this list, and if it comes back to us, great. But I would I would be I would support you know moving to to remove that from the list before we we fund any of these, and that was my response to that. Thank you, Zach. Uh, let's go up to Jerry Hart. Jerry. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I've, <clears throat> I think this is actually the first meeting on this that I've been able to attend. So I really appreciate uh, the format of the information provided. It's very easy to understand. And uh, for somebody like myself who wasn't able to attend meetings, it uh, uh, allowed me to, uh, uh, well, hopefully get up to speed pretty quickly. Uh, uh, loop back a little, little bit to water and light. My first question, or my first thought, was uh, uh, was whether why wasn't uh, water and light a direct recipient of funds? And uh, maybe there's a good explanation for that. Maybe there isn't. Maybe they <clears throat> uh, were a little bit tardy in their uh, understanding of the process and and. Uh, because they, uh, the ARPA funds can specifically be used to invest in water, sewer, broadband, and infrastructure, making necessary improvements to improve access to clean drinking water, et cetera. So uh, they are uh, an organization which, by virtue of their being, they being the water supplier for our community, uh, seems that they could have directly applied for the funds. Uh, so that's one question I would have. Uh, uh, I would have to wait until receiving additional information to really understand and evaluate their their uh, uh, their request. <clears throat> uh, personally, the, one, the couple things that I'm excited about are the uh, uh, I like the the uh, investment in Third Street in downtown. I think, um, I, gosh, I've been on. Uh, uh, you know, the downtown association board, I was its president. And I remember talking about infrastructure improvements going back into the late uh, 80s and into the 90s and into the 2000s and 2010 and 2020 and now 2021. Uh, it looks like there may be some motion on that. And I think that uh, would the council would be very wise to um, jump on it. Uh, when it can. Uh, this it's, it's one of those opportunities that doesn't come along very often. Uh, also very excited about the, what do you call it, the Innovation Center. I don't quite, you know, I don't fully understand it. And I was taken a little bit uh, aback when uh, in one of the letters that came in, uh, I think it was Jeff uh, Knapp, he mentioned that, you know, don't get too hung up on what that is. Well, I think we do need to get hung up on what it is because I don't quite understand exactly what um, the innovation. It sounds like a great idea. It sounds like something that could provide an economic boost to our community. Uh, and for that, I'm, I would be excited to have that included uh, and follow it and make sure that any funds that the city puts into it is used or, or used correctly. Also very excited about the uh, affordable housing component. Um, uh, those are just, I mean, that's just really important uh, given the uh, lack of, of uh, affordable housing and the ever increasing cost of construction, land acquisition, and all those other components that go into supplying affordable housing. So uh, that's what I got right now. And thanks for staff for putting all this together. So Jeff, do you want to a answer that first question? Yeah, real quickly, Jerry, I, I don't think uh, special districts 
um, like, uh, particularly municipal utilities like Water and Light were eligible for direct funding. While the work they do is eligible for ARPA funding, they have to rely on a, a general purpose government like the city or the county or the state to make their ARPA funds available. So they didn't receive any funds directly. And um, Jennifer um, may be able to add a little bit more clarity to that. Yeah, that's correct. Um, they absolutely did not miss any deadlines or anything like that. It, um, they just weren't on the list. Many municipalities, of course, have the water within their um, organization that's, I think, more typical. And so we just have a more unique setup. And so um, they would come they would come through us for access to this, these funding dollars specifically. Thank you. Okay, um, Councillor Chenoweth. Chris? So before I go, um, would it be possible to give Heather Richards a couple of minutes to explain the Innovation Center and answer any questions regarding that? to those that have questions on that? Would that be appropriate here? Since that's been brought up, I could see Zach was also, un, his facial reactions seem to indicate maybe he wasn't completely clear. So maybe there's others on this call that aren't clear on what that is. If we need clarification, I think that would be appropriate. I, I know we had detail in the breakout section of each of the projects, but Heather, if you could summarize a bit. Yeah, so the, the Innovation Center came out of the Three Mile Lane area planning process that started in 2017 and, and had um, really engaged public involvement. And what it is, it's 140 acres of the vacant land that's on the south side of Highway 18 that's currently zoned industrial. And the intention is, is to create a research and development business campus there. Um, not a research and development business campus as you think of from the 1990s, but more of one that is an uh, innovative incubator um, for our manufacturing businesses as well as for headquarters. So combining the two into one business campus so that they build off of each other's synergy. The request for funds is um, it's currently planned for something like seven jobs per acre and the innovation center would be more like 20, 25 jobs per acre. And so it's much, much more intensive use of that land and so what we need to do as the public side of it is figure out just what exists in the ground today in terms of wastewater and water and broadband and power to serve that site. Is there enough? And if there isn't enough, what's the deficiency and how do we, um, how do we build to meet that deficiency? Uh, we suspect that there probably will be broadband and power deficiencies. We know there are wastewater capacity deficiencies. And by not having that that feasibility analysis in place, we can't go after federal and state funds to actually build the infrastructure. It's not infrastructure on site that the private developer would have to do. It's infrastructure that the city is bringing to the site to support the higher and more intensive use of that land for those higher paying jobs. Hope that helps. Okay, so um, just wanna hit a couple of, I'm, I'm only gonna hit a couple and then I'll do the same thing that Adam's doing and kind of Wait on the wait on those wings and 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 go from there. Um, uh, I noticed on here a couple of things about public works operations, the building renovation and the yard renovation, and they weren't on the priority list. And I'm wondering um, what is the the if we don't get it funded now, what is what is the plan to get those buildings funded? and um, maybe a, a, a status on how bad they are. I've, I've gotten some, some feedback that has indicated to me that we're in borderline crisis in those buildings um, in that area. And if, so I'm wondering if I can get kind of what the, if we don't do it here, what's the plan? Sure, so um, I think that's an important priority and we already have funds available in the wastewater fund to begin the assessment of that work um, that can be loaned to the other parts of the operation. And so as we um, uh, start a review process, probably um, yet this fiscal year on what our options are, we really have four options. One is to do nothing, which in my mind isn't acceptable um, given the age and uh, status of those facilities. Uh, one is to rebuild on site. 
Uh, another is to um, relocate to the uh, wastewater facility uh, in conjunction with a, a pending upgrade, and the other is to potentially co-locate uh, with water and light. I think any of those last three are potential options, and we're going to start that assessment work um, fronted by wastewater utility funds um, in this coming year anyway, identify what our options are, and then figure out what our funding solutions are moving forward. So it's an important project. Um, the, the work that we're going to be doing is, is essentially funded in the next year or so, um, and ARPA funds wouldn't really be intended to do the, the, the physical improvements so much as they would to you know, potentially move the planning forward. And because we have other resources available, we decided to uh, use the, uh, uh, the already available resources that we have. Did you have anything you wanted to add to that, David? No, I don't, sir. I mean, it, it's, it's a 1970s facility that was renovated in the mid nineties and it's shown its age. That's a very fair thing to say. Um, I don't think we're in dire straits but uh, it's, it's definitely in time for, for some consideration of up upgrades. I've already talked to Jeff, but, you know, if it's too far in the offing, we'll, we'll do some short-term things out here to, to, to keep us going. Um, we have some siding work to do on the building I live in and probably some roofs. Um, we've, we've addressed some of our water issues with some, we, we bring in the water sources for the employees. Um, but yeah, it can definitely stand some work. Thank you. And then the other one I'll hit right now is on the, um, um, I got to find it. Um, I can't think of what it's called on here, but the, the funding for um, social services in place of the police. Um, my understanding, Jeff, is that we're currently, there's some talks going on behind the scenes um, with um, Yamhill County um, and Newburgh Police Department and McMinnville Police Department. Um, is this preempting that? Um, it would it would not preempt that. I'm going to actually ask Chief Scales to talk a little bit in more detail. But essentially, what we would be looking at is utilizing some ARPA funding to hire an initial consultant um, to sort of scope out that larger project with our partners, and we would look to the other partners to help support that work as well. Um, they're not really behind the scenes conversation. We'd like them to be out front of the scenes conversations. We've just had some challenge getting folks at the table. And so with that sort of medium level summary, let me turn it over to Matt to flesh it out with a little bit more detail. Great question though. Uh, thank you. Uh, and uh, Jeff really hit the nail on the head. This this request is to really jumpstart a, 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 a uh, this project in looking for uh, consultants to frame out what it, exactly this project could look like in Yamhill County. And, uh, you know, <clears throat> I always like to say we want to uh, walk, crawl before we sprint, you know, so we need to know exactly, we, we don't know what we don't know. So uh, this project or this, this specific piece of uh, utilization of ARPA funds would in fact provide us a roadmap moving forward as a city county as an entity altogether. Uh, all um, those conversations do continue, like uh, Jeff said, but uh, he answered it uh, probably better than I did. So so it, from your perspective, Chief, you're, you're, this, is, this is going along with the conversations that are already happening. That is not, correct. Not, okay, that's, that's what I want to make sure yeah. of, because I don't, I don't want, I, I am very supportive of those conversations and, and would love to be a party to them um, and love to see them move forward. Uh, um, so, and, and I've gotten some indication that there that, that there is support from the county to make this happen as well. So I just want to make sure we don't inadvertently close the door. Yes, sir. That this would not close that door. In fact, uh, my conversation okay, with the sheriff specifically is surrounding a, a project of this uh, of this sort. Perfect. One last thing I'll say, and then I'll get let I'll let Meredith go. Sorry, um, is that there? It has been some talk. We have uh, the speaking. I'm speaking. I'm putting on the hat of the EVLC. We have put in requests to the county for matching funds on the Innovation Center and on the um, Third Street renovation. So um, we don't have answers back on that. I can't speak with super surety until I get answers back on that that are solid, but there is potential to limit some of the dollar 
requests needed for both of those projects. And with that, I'll hand it off. Thank you, Chris. Uh, let's move over to Meredith. All right, uh, this, this was awesome. This document was really exciting to read more details and also to see the price tags. Um, if I'm understanding it correctly, if everything comes in at the highest price tag, it's gonna be around 8 million. So we're thinking we might be able, there, there's a chance we could fund the top 30 things, right? That's what I'm understanding. Um, so I just wanted to say that this is way more than I thought we'd be able to fund. When we were looking at that list that didn't have a lot of dollar amounts, um, I thought we'd have a lot harder um, decisions to make, but I just got out my list where I made my initial priorities and they were all on the top 30. So I'm really thrilled. This is, this is really exciting to be able, I feel like I can go back to, to people, all my friends and be like, oh yeah, you're interested in this? Yeah, we're gonna fund that, we're gonna fund that. So this is, this is wonderful. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you, Meredith. Okay, let's go over to uh, Debbie. Go ahead, Debbie. First of all, I'm with Meredith. It's more fun to be on this committee when we're handing out money than when we're saying we don't have any money. So thank you. Um, I, I am new to this, so I have no idea if I did it right, but I made my list of top, medium, and low priority as well. And I'm thrilled that it matched up so closely with what I'm seeing from the city. I did have two questions, I guess, and probably it's my limited understanding here. One thing on my medium list that is not appearing, I think, is the Wortman Shelter. And I'm just uh, wondering what our thought is about that. I'm wondering if, if, if that were in better shape, would we be able to rent that facility out more? And, and would that be a possible revenue source? And the other that I just don't understand enough maybe is the facilities manager, which is now in our top priorities. Is that a limited term position or are we picking up some carrying costs by adding in that position? Well, let me answer the first question and I'll um, turn it over to David. Um, I'm sorry, I'll answer the second question. I'll turn the first question over to David. So right now we don't have um, focused facilities management maintenance program. Um, the, each facility is managed by somebody who works in the facility. You're looking at the person who manages City Hall my wife and others will tell you that's not the highest and best use of my time and that's not where my skill set is so we want to hire an expert in facilities management uh, and utilize our um, asset management software that's being upgraded uh, sort of as we speak um, to build a plan to really effectively reinvest in our public facilities. So this position would be ongoing. It would be supported by the organization at large. This is one of those projects that we think is a high priority, whether there are ARPA funds or not. And we think that ARPA is a, a reasonable way to jumpstart the program. So we wouldn't look to ARPA to fully fund the program or to fully fund investment in the facilities, but would look to ARPA to initially hire and support that position for, I don't know, six to 12 to 18 months, some limited duration. The, the position would continue on and ultimately be allocated across the organization, um, but we need to also rely on new revenue that the council and budget committee are sort of separately, but at the same time contemplating. So um, so that's what that was one of the reasons that's sort of a jumpstart program that have carrying costs, but it feels like the right way to spend some of these dollars because we have such significant needs in our capital facilities right now. Um, uh, you, I don't know how much we've really talked about it because it's such a daunting number in the budget process, but we actually went through all of our facilities, David, wait, three years ago, I guess, and had a full on assessment of all of the capital needs for every structure that we own. And it's a, it's a huge, gnarly, nasty number. And to really get our hands around it, we need to have somebody who's dedicated and an expert to do this work. So I will turn it over to David to talk about the Wortman um, shelter replacement with this caveat. As with many of our other priorities, we've asked departments to set their priorities as well. And we've tried to respect those internal priorities as we've worked our way through the higher level prioritization. So the things that are on the higher priority list in the same department are ranked higher than this particular project. Um, so I'll turn it over to David to talk in a little bit more detail about that uh, specific project. Thank you. Sure, thanks, Jeff. So, um, ma'am, what we're talking about here is, is a 1950s era uh, shelter. 
that it's just at the well beyond its useful life. It's, it's not unsafe. It still gets rented. We're not renting things right now because of COVID, but up until COVID, it was still being used by the public. It just needs renewal. I um, mean, so it really isn't, a, it, it's not, I, I wouldn't identify any of our uh, shelters as tremendous revenue sources because we do garner revenue from renting them. But there's, of course, which each, each number of rental, we have a maybe not equal, but close to equal uh, cost in, in prepping it and then cleaning up afterwards. So it's really more of a, of a project that's aimed at renewing that asset um, and, and, and putting a, a nicer shelter in one of our, quite honestly, one of our flagship parks. Thank you. I, the fact that you said it's not yet unsafe helps me because that was one of the things that had it on my list. Appreciate that. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, let's go to Allison. Hello. Hello, everyone. Um, I agree with Meredith and Debbie. When I did my own list, I found that it matched up very well. I'm very appreciative of all the process we've been through, and I thought it matched up very well. There are a couple of um, small ones that didn't make it onto the um, high or medium priority list that I would just like to ask about. One, I think a $300,000 investment in cybersecurity, given the risks, would be um, worth considering to move higher on the list. I don't think we can ever well be well enough prepared, but. Uh, especially if that's going to be a shared resource, as I saw that it was in the explanation. Um, and then just from an optics perspective, I think mending the irrigation systems in the parks, um, that the general public see that a lot. I certainly see that a lot. And even if it isn't really being wasted in the way that it looks like it is, when we go out to the general public and ask them to be... Um, you know, um, cautious about the way they use public resources and then the irrigation systems are pouring continuously. I mean, uh, in Joe Dancer this summer, my dog used it as a permanent showering device. I mean, it was just, it just always pours. So I just think $250,000 of one-time money to get the irrigation system fixed would be a good optical investment for the city. So apart from that, I'm very much in favor of everything that's been selected. I did have the same questions on water and light, which I already sent to Jeff today. So I appreciated the councillors also asking the questions that I had. Thank you. David, do you want to address the, the irrigation at the parks at all? Sure. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Basically, what we're looking at doing is is upgrading as many systems as we can for that dollar figure. And what what it would it would focus it would begin with Dancer. Uh, I'm glad the, the budget committee met, member mentioned that. Um, Dancer is a it's a very complex um, uh, system. Lots and lots of zones. Lots and lots of heads. And if you know water and light system, it sits at the very bottom of the whole shooting match. So it has the highest pressures in the whole system. And so we're continually dealing with blowouts there. And so I suspect some of the rainfall she was talking about was related to blowouts we have there. And it's one of the systems we have to keep running, of course. We can't just shut it down zone by zone because it supports athletic events. So um, that is going to be a significant focus of that. Then we want to circle back and, and look at systems like, an, um, for example, I was in Upper City Park this year. And Susan's team had put together just a great concert just a terrific event kind of in the shadow of the pool under all those trees under nice brown grass. So it'd be nice to put that system back in running order. One of the things is since we've had the mothball systems, irrigation systems aren't, it's not just a simple matter of turning them off and turning them back on five years later. So there are upgrades that have to happen, whether it's piping or heads or non nozzle adjustments or controllers or those sorts of things. So it's kind of similar to the conversation we had about um, fleet and equipment. It's a it's a chance to reset the entire system, or at least as much as much of the system as we can, um, to get us kind of back to where we need to get to. So we, we certainly are excited about the opportunity to do that. 
David, a question that I would have is many of our systems that are in the grounds are many, many years old. I'm guessing Joe Dancer has been in the ground for quite a while. What is the useful life of an irrigation system? And then secondarily, there's been nuances to system development now that I think probably pushes the useful life out. So could you answer those two questions? Sure, the, the, the bulk of our systems, systems built in the 70s, moving forward, we're almost all PVC pipe, class 100 or class 200 pipe with probably schedule 40 main line. The real issue at Dancer, quite honestly, is 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 the glue used in the original construction, the the the, the, the pressure, and then in some areas, it's not very, very, very deep. So when you drive a tractor or a truck um, over, a, over a T, for example, that's only 18 inches deep, you're gonna have damage. So, but I mean, from a useful life and irrigation system, the piping system is gonna last 50 to 75 years as long as it's not exposed to sunlight. Pre-1970s, you're in, in more of the black, um, what I call hard plastic pipe. Uh, like I, I, we, we, I think we, we used to call it Driscoll 900, I think is what it used to be called. Um, that stuff rots. We don't have a lot of those systems. The, the star mill side of City Park has some of that. Um, but most of our systems are, 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 are PVC. So it, it isn't so much the piping, except for places like Dancer. It's really, it's really heads and valves and probably stations, or no, excuse me, controllers. Controllers are really where the big upgrades are gonna be. One of the things we can do is we, we've adopted a standard now is when we put in new controllers to try to make them, I can't remember the right word, but they're smart, capable. In other words, eventually we can get to a system where we could actually remotely control them um, and, and that gives you a ton of power. If, you're, if I'm sitting in the office on a rainy day and dance are scheduled to run, you can turn the system off, right? As opposed to having to have rain sensors or those sorts of things that are kind of outdated. So uh, again, you're right, there's a lot of new new nuances in systems and it's just a chance to kind of push ourselves into the 20, I'm always accused of not living in the 21st or 22nd century. So this is a chance to kick my butt into that. So anyway, I hope that answers your question. Thank you, David. It does give some uh, clarity around that. Uh, Allison, did that answer your questions? Oh, yes, thank you. Uh, obviously not the cybersecurity, but that that's just, uh, I'll leave that to someone else, but thank you, yes. Yeah, well, cybersecurity wouldn't be me. Yes. So, so, Mayor, let, let me jump in. I actually, I've got the wrong attachment open on my screen. I actually think that irrigation system is in our medium and high priorities, Allison. So. Um, we think it's important too, but let me make sure we actually have it on the list. Amanda's digging for it right now. Um, second, um, could it be number sixteen, Jeff? It's number sixteen on the funded list, so I think I think we've got it in there. Um, the other thing on cybersecurity is this particular project isn't the only work we do on cybersecurity, so we're not not paying attention to cybersecurity. This one in particular has some carrying some long-term carrying costs. Uh, in the form of a potential shared position between maybe the city and the county. Um, Scott Burke is on the line, so I'm gonna ask Scott to talk a little bit more about sort of at a high level what we're doing and, and what the value add might be to this and how we might be able to fund this in the future even without ARPA funding. So I'll turn that over to Scott, thanks. Sure, thanks Jeff and uh, Mr. Mayor and members of the committee. Um, as Allison noted, we're looking towards partners with, we're partnering with other local agencies to work towards increasing our cybersecurity posture. And as Jeff mentioned earlier, um, we expect there to be a fair amount of grant money available in upcoming federal infrastructure bills to manage some of those investments, um, possibly sharing personnel with county and other local agencies. Um, that would be a great way to focus it in the near future and outside of the original ARP funding. Um, I would also point out that on the initial list, um, what our department felt was the highest priority, which was a reinvestment in the city's firewall that was put in place in 2015. Um, that's a long time between 2022, we're gonna see some of this money. Um, that's a pretty large investment in our cybersecurity posture. That's a number one defense and what we consider to be the key piece of our of our cybersecurity posture as it stands right now. If we can address that first, then we can wait and see a little bit what unfolds with the federal infrastructure bill and potential grants and then still manage to get our key needs met when balance with the rest of the city. Okay. Thanks, Scott. And I see uh, Chris put his thumbs up, so he agrees with some of that also. Okay, uh, Allison gave, giving a little more uh, insight into that cybersecurity. 
Oh, yes, that's good. Thank you. Um, also, I'm sorry about the irrigation. I think there was another parks maintenance. It's because it was described as parks maintenance, and I think there was another one on the list. Um, so I just didn't realize that was irrigation. So thank you. No okay. worries. Thank you very much. Let's go up to uh, Councillor Peralta. Sal. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, first, I just want to say thanks to the staff for putting together such a thoughtful and comprehensive list. Uh, I went through and tried to punch holes through any of the items on the list, and I really couldn't quibble with with anything, particularly given the um, context of the conversation tonight. Um, the only note that I would have, I guess the two notes that I'd have, one of them was mentioned, was that it seems like we have uh, both the emergency manager position and the facilities manager positions uh, funded. Uh, and those are ongoing positions through one-time dollars. And, uh, you know, I guess I'm a little concerned about that um, you know, agreeing to fund those positions with one-time dollars when we don't have a, a certain revenue stream to continue the funding for those positions beyond the six to 18 months that Jeff uh, identified. And I assume that would be kind of the same for both. Um, not that they're not necessarily needed, but, um, you know, I think we need to figure out how to make that work organizationally, particularly when there's also other demands on, on public dollars. I mean, there's talk of, you know, a, deputy city manager and other kinds of administrative positions so you know i think we need to be real thoughtful about right sizing the organization um definitely agree with fully funding the uh parks master plan um and uh you know the only other note that i have is that you know i definitely appreciated chief scales comments earlier tonight about you know learning to walk before we could run in terms of addressing um, some of the effects of homelessness and I definitely agree with the importance of, of you know the that very small first step that we're looking at with these funds um, you know I guess if I would say that I, I would love to have something a little further along towards addressing some of the effects of homelessness in the community um, that maybe allocating some funds towards something like that, whether that's figuring out a way to improve um, sanitation at certain places so that, you know, people can get a hot shower or, or you know, address some of those kinds of basic human needs that are not going to go away. We're going to be dealing with those as a community on an ongoing basis. Um, but beyond that, I think great job, and I really appreciate the um, work that everybody put into it on the staff side. Thank you, Sal. Uh, Wendy, I have to apologize because I think you had taken your hand out thinking you were in the queue and, uh, and uh, you fell out. So we'll do Wendy and then we'll go back to, uh, Adam never took his hand down. So we may go back to, to Adam and then to Zach. So Wendy. Thank you. Uh, I actually put my hand down because everybody was having a Nerf gun war in the house. So it got really loud and I was really afraid that I'd get called on in the middle of a Nerf gun war. <laughs> so I put my head, hand down willingly, but I do appreciate the leapfrog. Um, I'm very it's so, uh, so thankful for everybody who contributed to this document. It makes it really, really easy to digest all of this information and there is so much of it. So thank you to everybody. Um, I'm also very pleased with the multiple lines devoted to the parks and the maintenance and getting everything in all of our parks, not just Rotary Park, where I think every tree fell down during the ice storm and the <laughs> lower city park where there's just, it's a big play structure to maintain. And I can't imagine what it's like to have to fix everything that, that breaks. And uh, by our house, we have Discovery Park and there's quite a few of the toys that have broken and not getting fixed and there's just a lot there that needs maintenance so I'm really really happy to see the parks represented on multiple lines I would like to see there's the line 24 is specifically to the repairs of the playground equipment I'd like to see that moved up in the priority list if at all possible it seems that no matter how you slice it even on the high end everything should get done with these numbers but I would I'd be I would, I would regret not saying anything if the lower items get booted because of some kind of uh, 
because funding didn't make it to those items. So I would really like to see the, the playground equipment specifically get moved up a little bit higher. Thank you. Um, maybe I can address that sort of larger issue right now. Um, uh, Wendy, thanks for your, for your comments. We appreciate it. Um, as with some of the other budget issues that we bring forward, while we have prioritized these in order, um, some of them require other work to be done to move ahead. And so the first item on the list may not get the first dollars out. And so when I talked earlier about bringing forward some implementation plans and project plans, you know, we can't do it all at once. And, um, and we would bring forward um, a variety of projects sort of um, staggered in time as we have the capacity to work on them. And um, it also sort of does dovetails with Councillor Peralta's comments uh, with respect to those um, two projects in particular that, that he mentioned, the emergency management manager and the facilities manager, we would need to have some clarity from the council and budget committee that you were pursuing uh, um, a, a additional um, general fund revenue that could take on those carrying costs before we'd invest in those in that first round of costs. So, so the the detailed implementation plans and strategies could change the order in which some of these projects are funded. Uh, some things are easier to jump on quicker than um, uh, than other things. So, um, there'd be more to come in terms of when and how the money uh, would flow out and in which order we would work on these projects. So, just wanted to clarify that. Thank you, Jeff. I appreciate the clarification. Clarification. So, Wendy, I, I just wanted to make sure you understood that, that item number 24 is actually specific to neighborhood parks, which are our smaller systems and, and the Discovery Meadows and up, Upper City that what we call the, the Recreation Station. Those are in a different project, which I think is in the not funded list. I don't think it's on this list. So these are for parks like um, Bendel River or Kingwood or, or places that have 1970s era um play equipment that's never been updated so i just wanted to make sure you didn't understand, didn't think that 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 money was going to be dedicated towards our community park systems because the, the, the community park systems they're closer to a half a million dollars for both those two structures so i just wanted to clarify that thank you david i appreciate that and then just to note i would really like to see some money go to fixing the equipment at the community parks then also um yeah, all yeah. the parks would be great to have to be able to take the kids to and have an you know all work all work is a is a big dream but um a lot of working would be great thank you everybody yes, appreciate that thank you wendy uh so now let's uh, go back up to adam and see if he still has questions then we'll go to zach and then to meredith adam uh, yeah, number 12 on the list, the smaller capacity project. I was just curious um, if there's that sort of money in water or that can't come out of like wastewater type of pump that not funded, fairly well funded, um, and why we need to use our dollars for that. Jeff, or I would call my assistant, but he's not here, so do elaborate on that. Uh, Adam, you broke up quite a bit, but let's see, uh, Jeff, who, who would be best to take care of that? I couldn't hear which project it was. Could you repeat that, Adam, or maybe Storm, you heard he it? was storm, stormwater management, number 12. Yeah. Stormwater yeah. capacity projects. Yes. So let's see, I don't think Leland is on the call tonight. Um, one of the things that we identified, uh, he's, he's on Jeff. Oh, there, oh, there is Leland. Okay. So let me do a high level introduction, then turn it over to Leland. Um, one of the, I think Jeff, I, I talk to mine. Is that one yours, David? Okay. I'm going to let them fight over who talks about it. <laughs> um, so one of the things that we're able to do, um, to spend the ARPA funds is, is that we spend it in, um, designated census tracts where the per capita income is lower than whatever the standard is in the bill. There are fewer hurdles to justify the infrastructure dollars. And we do have some of our lower income neighborhoods where have stormwater issues. And we, when we on a regular basis, um, are in the process of, you know, flooding people's property periodically. Um, so with that sort of high level, um, introduction, let me turn it over to David and or Leland. Uh, and then there's actually sort of a legal component to this one that I'd ask Amanda to address 
after um, David talks. Thank you, Jeff. So in, in all transparency, it, this will, in the not too near future, become Leyland's as we move towards the stormwater utility. Um, but basically, this is aimed at a specific neighborhood in town that we've had multiple um, incidents over the last 10 years in really heavy rain events is the 13th and Galloway neighborhood, which is just south of the high school. And we um, have really done a pretty good job maintaining the system, but we just don't have the capacity in those pipes to deal with the, with the and, and it becomes really kind of an issue in a very intense rainfall. So what winds up happening is that the system backs up and floods those intersections. We've gotten water into people's basements. We've gotten water into ground floor, ground floor apartments. Um, and, and it's really a tough deal. And because uh, stormwater is an unfunded, um, effort in our community it's basically paid for from the street fund um, it's with there are no capital dollars to do any work so what this would do is it would fund the engineering studies to be able to identify what the constraints are in that area and what what would have to happen to improve that and, and hopefully some construction dollars to, to tackle some of that um, we tied it to ARPA because essentially what happens is to alleviate it during the event we basically have to offload that water onto the sanitary system so it becomes an I and I issue because that's the only conveyance we have to get rid of the water in that neighborhood. Unfortunately, it's fairly specific to that neighborhood. We, we do have intermittent problems in other neighborhoods, but this is this is an area that we, if we have a high rainfall event, we know we're going to have issues. And so this is an opportunity to start addressing that um, pre a stormwater utility. And then just to tag on to that, as David indicated, that um, the, the design and planning work that would be funded by ARPA, uh, we think would set us up potentially for funding from community development block grant or maybe some other um, state programs that could uh, support the capital cost. And so let me uh, turn it over now to Amanda to sort of add the cherry on top of the stormwater Sunday. Well, I was actually going to say um, I would advise all of us not to talk too much about this because we actually have this is an ongoing legal issue that we are currently dealing with but to say just to reiterate what david said in that we don't have a dedicated funding source to resolve this capital problem and it's a capacity issue not a defect issue and so it's something that um needs to be resolved but through some type of capital project that we don't currently have a funding source other than, um, as David indicated, you know, either through street funds, but that's really not how we should be using our store, how we should be using our street funds. So in lieu of a dedicated stormwater fee, which we don't have, um, you know, this is a good way to kick off the, a project in this area that's desperately needed. Thank you, Amanda. Adam, did that answer your question? Uh, yeah, that does that does answer my question. Can you guys hear me better now, or is it still yes. broken up? Yes, you're coming through good. Okay, so that that leads me to my next point, uh, totally unrelated to storm and water. But thank you for the context on that. Um, when we were going through this list, we were also in application for a safer grant, which we now know we did not get. And um, when we look at our last work session on the 28th we also can see that in our top 10 core services um, we fall remarkably short on fire and EMS services and it would be I would like to make a, a motion or a recommendation to remove the water and lights one million dollars and get our our fire department some some staffing to address our response times that have resulted in affordable housing burning down, response times that have resulted in 47 full-time jobs leaving the area for the foreseeable future because Organic Valley burnt down in April of this year, um, as well as you can look at utilization hour studies from our fire district consulting. Um, I do acknowledge that that's an ongoing cost and um, we also have other ongoing costs on this list and and that we as council would have to find a way if, if that district did not go through in May or that district took till November to go through or didn't go through at all for whatever reason, uh, that is an ongoing expense that we're gonna have to, to figure out a way to cover. But um, I would like to see us spend 1.26 and, and get uh, the fire moved over one block and the EMS, uh, new 24-hour ambulance 
in the system to get our citizens some relief on response times and uh, I, I do believe it would also alleviate some HR with the amount of turnover we see there. So that's something that's not on the list that I would like to hear other committee members and other counselors thoughts on it. And uh, I can get a lot more specific on statistics if we want to go over data on where we fall short. Thank you, Adam. Uh, let's let's go back up now with Zach, Meredith, Chris, and Sal. Go ahead, Zach. I did. I did. Does staff have a jump in on any any follow up? I can't see any heads. Um, so I mean. We can talk about it as uh, as you like. I just want to make sure we give enough time for the committee to ask questions and have discussions. We may not fully resolve this issue tonight. So there's, there's several items to follow up on, and I'd rather um, not take the last 18 or 19 minutes if we've still got questions and comments in the queue. Okay. Um, I have a couple things. It's nice waiting in a queue full of people waving their hands because they all answer ask my questions for me. Um, so a handful of them did, but I think just jumping back on, on Adams, as far as um, one of the things the staff report is what other information, I think, especially in light of our pledge on the safer grant and then finding out we didn't get it, I, I think seeing information and and um, structures and numbers and data on, on, ha on ways we could make our own stopgap uh, costs for that or the stopgap or bridges to the district in light of the safer grant not coming through which we were kind of you know when we had that discussion on moving forward with that was was going to be what we did to, to get us there I think ha coming back with numbers especially as we go engage in this ARPA dollar discussion and, and I know they've got an ambulance on there but as we go to the revenue discussion I think I think that'd be worth seeing um, numbers and facts and figures um, uh, on that so I would I would support that um, what Councillor Garvin had said. I think also the the staff report here on, on this was really great, which is a, kind of a hot streak of really good information. I had a couple uh, last questions. Also, you know, Sal had asked about at onboarding two new staff, and and I think that kind of got answered as to how we we make the pledge on continuing those 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 continuous requests for dollars every year. Um, but I see the value of those positions, and so I think it's it's kind of down you know down to. D doubling down on my support for, and I think what I think committee member Seiler had come, said many weeks ago as we started this discussion on these dollars was really doing investing in things that the c community will see right away with huge impact. And, and I think this list really does that, you know, uh, the maintenance fleet and the public works items, as well as, as well as the parks and open spaces plan and, and the in investments in, in the parks, which I would agree with uh, committee member Phoenix of moving those up, um, really go hand in hand and if we're going to pledge to endeavor to you know study the future of the parks i, I would say that the the much needed investment boost in our in our maintenance fleet to maintain not only what we have but what we hope to have in the future is is pretty crucial um so i would you know i'm supporting those and, and hoping that we move up on number 24. i guess the hottest take i have now then is is at this time i, I think number eight on the list that innovation center I, I don't feel real strongly at this point of investing these dollars in that study i think that the third street one is a big study and a big swing and, and a really much needed investment i i think um while it's not a either or choice i think um, I think number eight is just to, and while I do understand the project and what the ask is, I don't, I don't think at this time I'm, I'm feeling good with, with writing that check for that project uh, at this time. So that one kind of is the biggest one left on here after these questions that we've asked. Um, that and that Mac one and light one on here are, are the two on the high priority list that I just, I'm not feeling like uh, ready to support at this time. So um, that's my uh, comment for the section. And then uh, one more, I guess one last question is the pro process wise uh, are we viewing the high and medium as two separate lists when we talk about uh, when we talk about what we're what we're supporting is that going forward I'm still I guess I'm just circling the drain on process here and understanding what we're going to do to go forward we're going to go line by line and take a up or down vote we're going to go all in on high and then all in on medium or or what's the process so so those are the ones I do and don't support and then a question about process yeah, I think that that's that's the last slide, which is next steps, which is how, how do you want to handle it? And if I could just jump in as well, we actually have a 
um, budget committee meeting scheduled for tonight. I think it was technically supposed to start at 630, but that's all right. Um, to discuss and have a potential vote for a recommendation to the council. Based on how the discussion is going tonight, my guess is that a recommendation on the entire attachment A, which is both high and medium priority, is probably not likely. It's, it sounds like pe different people have some different questions that they still want answered, but it would be in a budget committee meeting where somebody could make a motion and then through that motion, you could also make um, motions to amend. So if one person wanted to see about taking a project off the list or bumping up a project, you could do that through that process. And, and we can incorporate that in your October 20th work session. Yeah, there seems to be enough uh, movement that I don't know that we have enough time to give a, a fair discussion tonight in the budget. So, Jeff, if we can move the budget committee meeting uh, to our next meeting, and it gives us a little more time to reach out and clarify some of our, 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 our thoughts on that. Yeah, we'll be prepared to do that. Okay. Thank you, Amanda, for bringing that up. But I got a sense that we weren't going to be able to do justice during the, the, the budget uh, committee meeting. Uh, so, Zach, uh, does that answer your questions or have you had an opportunity? Uh, well, it doesn't not answer my question, if that's helpful. Uh, yeah. That, but, it, yeah, it does. I, that tells me that we're not doing it now, I guess. So, Good. Yeah, we're going to have some time. Okay, let's go to Meredith and then Chris. And just to give you a time frame, uh, we've got about 10 minutes left. Okay, real quick, I just wanted to comment um, on how important number 22 is to me that was added. It wasn't on the initial list, the um, translating all the documents into Spanish. As someone who doesn't need documents translated into Spanish, I didn't know that was something that wasn't already done. So I would love to just know that everything it is available to all the citizens in the language that they read and speak. So that's really important to me. Especially in that about 25% of our population uh, needs that assistance. Okay, let's go to uh, uh, Chris, go ahead. So, uh, sorry, hitting the wrong buttons here. Um, so first, I'd, I'd like to know on number th uh, number three, the navigation center. Um, I don't see in the description of this, my understanding was $3.5 million was uh, earmarked to the navigation center. And I don't see that even referenced in the description of this. Um, can I get an understanding of, of why that's not included and, 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 and and secondarily, the navigation center, as I understand it, is going to be run by YCAP. Um, so wouldn't they be the ones needing to fund this? And perhaps maybe Yamhill County, from Yamhill County's $21 million of ARPA money they got, be more appropriate for the funding source for that. Um, so I'll, I'll turn to Heather. Um, we actually got an earmark of $1.5 million um, through the House bill that um, that uh, passed this last session. Um, and we are in the process of working with both uh, Yamhill County and with YCAP to move the project forward, including the opportunity uh, for um, support funds from Yamhill County's ARPA allocation. I'll turn it over to Heather for some more detailed response. Yeah, so uh, Councillor Chenoweth, the 1.5 million that's that's referenced in the write-up is is what what we did receive from Representative Noble's efforts on our behalf uh, to build the navigation center and to operate it. Um, the city obviously is not in the business of operating these types of facilities, so we approached YCAP to be the operator for it. Um, we uh, to do so YCAP is calculating what they would need for operations and we're also looking at what the construction costs are and we just don't have enough to do both. Um, so we have we have made a challenge to Yam Hill County to that the city would pay for one years of operations that the county would pay for one year of operations and then YCAP's work, working on sustainable funding for operations through the state. The state right now is focused on funding the project turnkey projects in terms of operations. All project turnkey projects are meant to transition into permanent supportive housing in two to three years, and that's when the navigation center will sort of start to fill that gap. 
And so it's expected that state funding will come for the navigation center in about two to three years as well. So there what but there was a 3.5 million as well as a 1.5 million. Did that go to turnkey or where did that 3.5? No, so what you're referencing is Representative Noble had we just met with him this morning and he clarified some of this stuff for us. He was able to put four um, he was able to put the 1.5 million into the house bill, the Christmas tree bill that everyone talks about. Um, for the navigation center and then they were able to submit 12 additional projects um, to try and get funding for them and in that list of 12 additional projects was the 3.5 million we had we knew 1.5 wasn't enough and we had asked them for more after the 1.5 was secured um, the 3.5 was not funded so that's on sort of the wait list for funding if they're if they scrub through all the state projects and find out that some of them don't qualify and there's additional funding, but there's a lot of projects on that wait list for funding. So it's not something that we can really necessarily rely on. Mm -hmm. And we need to have this center up and operating by June 30th, 2022, or we pay the 1.5 million back. Okay, thank you. I, I, and and if you're if you're working out working with Yamhill County, then perfect. That's I just don't want to. I feel like it, this is not just going to be us. It's entire Yamhill County. Yeah, I can't. Thank I, you. I can't guarantee Yamhill County's participation. We're trying to figure out how to get it into the process for dialogue. Um, but but we are making a valiant effort for that. Understand. Perfect. The last thing, because I got to get out of the way for Sal. He's got to have some minutes here. The last thing I'd like to say is um, I'm 100% behind. Uh, Councillor Adam Garvin's statement regarding funding some some uh, fire department personnel. Um, I, I'm so much behind it. I wouldn't mind seeing even a motion this evening once we move to uh, to the to the uh, general meeting um, and to to see this ball move forward. It's it's we are long overdue in helping the firefighters and and the the morale over there. They need some more help. Um, so I just want to get that support in there. Thank you, Chris. Let's go on to Sal. Go ahead, Sal. Uh, thanks, Mayor. Yeah, I I would just like to echo, um, you know, Zach and Adam and Chris and, and just saying that I'd like to see uh, some numbers come back for um, stop gapping the fire services and EMS services uh, until we go to districting. It, I mean, this year has really shown that we need to, to address that. And if we have to go it alone because we didn't get federal funding through the safer grant then you know even with all of the other challenges that we have i think we need to i think we need to bite the bullet and do it so okay um uh, uh, kelly just really short uh i think uh, some funding for staff is a fairly high priority on the core services so i'm not entirely sure that that's being a neglected item okay it is uh uh, we've got about five more minutes for any last discussions. Uh, again, I think we have indicated that we will not have the budget committee meeting tonight where the budget committee could vote and send something to the city council. Um, so I'll just, again, any last moments? I know there's kind of a pending uh, to address uh, fire support with EMT. Uh, Jeff, you've heard that. And so maybe we can wrap that into our dialogue in our next meeting as we come and complete that. So, so Mayor, what, what we would suggest is you actually handled the second discussion question as we were working our way through it. Uh, we've been taking notes uh, uh, about the comments. The, um, the, it's clear that we need more specific information on the water and light project before I sense a, a consensus of the group um, to move forward. Um, I think it's also um, um, appropriate that you ask for some funding alternatives to um, for how to fill those um, ambulance um, positions that weren't funded by the safer grant since we got that um, information just last week. It'd be great if we could involve the fire chief in that and he's not in town for a couple of days. So, you know, rather than a motion telling us how to spend the money, we'd like to bring back 
uh, a couple of alternatives for you to consider uh, to, to be able to move that important project forward. Um, we will be bringing this larger issue back to you. There'll be some other uh, project details and follow up that we'll pull together uh, and we'll uh, fold this into your um, conversation at your next work session on the 20th of October and hopefully give you the opportunity to, um, to move some recommendations forward on, on, on these projects. Thank you, Jeff. Um, good discussion this evening. I think all have shared uh, with, uh, with Jeff and the city staff how well put together this document was. A lot of reading, but again, it was thoughtful. It, it summarized a lot of the comments that we have done. And so again, we will follow up on, at our next uh, city council meeting uh, where we will have uh, we will have more detailed information so that we could possibly have the work session go into a budget uh, committee meeting and, and move that forward to city council. With that being said, I will go ahead and adjourn the joint uh, work session this evening at uh, 6.56. And so we'll uh, jump on to the Zoom meeting for our regularly scheduled council meeting. Thank you all. Video. There's got to be a filter somewhere, Zach. The old stop video. There's not enough filters in the world.
Recording in progress. It is seven o'clock, and so I would like to call to order the City of McMinnville City Council meeting on October the 12th, 2021, and call on Claudia to do a roll call. Claudia? Councilor Geary? Good evening. Councilor Garvin? Here. Councilor Minky? Here. Councilor Peralta? Here. Councilor Chenoweth? Present in body. Council President Drapkin? Here. And Mayor Hill? Here. Thank you and welcome everyone to our meeting this evening. Uh, I'll go ahead and Chris, could I call on you to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance this evening? Sure. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Counselor. Uh, this evening, uh, we're to that point where we will have comments from our community members and uh, any community member that uh, would like to is invited to provide comments um, if there are any comments that need to, and require any type of follow-up, that will be assigned to a staff member to follow up with. Anyone may speak on any topic other than a matter in litigation, a quasi-judicial land use matter, or a matter scheduled for public hearing at some future date. Uh, please uh, announce yourself uh, when you speak your name uh, you will be limited to three minutes and the total session will be 30 minutes this evening uh, if you wish to speak you can raise your hand in the uh, zoom feature and uh, request to speak uh, again when your turn is when it's time for you please uh, announce your name unmute well unmute your mic announce your name and or you can send a uh, a chat directly to our city recorder, Claudia, and that will announce you. We'll also give an opportunity for those that are on the phone that do not have the Zoom functions, the ability to do that. So, uh, Claudia, do we have anyone that signed up to speak this evening? Yes, we'll start with Dr. Pierce on Zoom. Dr. Pierce. Hi. How are you? Hello. This good. How are you? Very good. Good. Um, just as I was just wanted to comment as we're going into the budget conversations about the ARPA and um, one, the survey response was really low, which I think speaks to this idea that maybe that we need to have different ways that we get the survey out to people, um, maybe hitting the streets. I mean, it seems like some of the recalls get more uh, notice than uh, city funds. And I'm sure people are more, much more interested in that. Um, and so I think there's more we can do there, uh, which is great. And then also uh, looking at the, the way the funds, it seems like the survey was a guided survey, not necessarily asking people where they want their money to go, as opposed to just like, this is where we want it to go. What are your thoughts on that? And so it kind of leaves out the personal opinion piece. And these funds are COVID relief funds. And our taxes didn't go down. Our city sewer water didn't go down. So we, the community is still paying the same rate. And I know you're losing money potentially in other ways, but if we're talking about like, if you don't invest in the community and the people in the community, then we lose, like, like a lot of the things are just things that the city needs. So it's like, oh good, we're getting this windfall of money. The city is really overdue and I get it. Like the, the, the HVAC for the library needs to be done. That's important. But people lost their jobs. We have like houseless communities. We have people with traumatic PTSD. I mean, I, I have patients that are on the brink of suicide and are not able to work and need American Disability Act right now. And that's not even working for them. And so we need to, to have these funds also. We, we can use these funds as stimulus for the people. They also can be used for that. And so 
Um, so let's not leave out the individuals in the community. And instead, like, yes, things in the community need to be um, south. Did you want to say something? Um, yes, people in the community need to, uh, like, we need the, the main things in the, the city taken care of, but we also can't lose sight of the people. And I just don't see much for, I know that overall those things are supposed to help the people, but the individual emergency relief that people need right now, it's not going to help them if the library's HVAC is held. Like, it's not gonna help them if the city has new um, equipment for yard debris. So let's just not, for, I, there was something about like city parks, new equipment or something in there. So I think it's all important, but maybe also just more for the people. Just my thoughts. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. Okay. Uh, one other thought this evening is, again, we may have a lot of information coming in this evening. And if we do on the same topic, please bring new items as you're talking and that we don't reiterate the same uh, testimony over and over this evening. So we'll go to Claudia and, uh, and uh, who's next? Next, we have Tynan Piers on Zoom. Tynan, welcome. Uh, hi, everyone. Appreciate you taking the time tonight. And that was definitely an informative packet. I can't claim to be well versed on all, all 188 pages of it. It's definitely a lot to look through. And I do appreciate the survey. And Scott, I understand that you're asking people not to reiterate ideas. However, I just disagree with that. I think that the more people that have thoughts on a similar idea lets you know how many people agree on that same topic. So I will probably reiterate a few things that Dr. Pierce just mentioned. And That's fine. Yeah. I understand your point of view, but I just think about that differently. And so overall, there was definitely some things in there I, I think are wonderful. I think there's some great ideas that you all are working hard towards. And, and it seems like, once again, there's a lot of people whose hearts are really in the right place with a lot of where you want to put this money. I do agree overall that there's potentially a way we could offer direct aid for those who need it and who can who are potentially having a harder time qualifying for state or national funding. That's a really important thing that the city could potentially allocate some of this money to do, direct rental aid. Uh, direct help for people who are experiencing income loss, those sorts of things, especially, you know, with with many factors that I'm sure many of you have experienced yourselves. And then additionally, um, I'm, I mean, the Stratus housing is awesome and the Navigation Center is awesome. And the idea of the crisis management emergency health teams, I would love to see that a higher priority and more than just a contract for kind of looking into it and more commitment to that. I mean, that's a pretty low ball number on there, like 15 to you know 30 ish thousand, I think it was or right around there. Whereas the grant writer position is like 300,000 over three years, which I mean, don't get me wrong. I think people should get paid living wages, but 100 grand a year for the grant writers kind of I just see I, I personally see that you could re reallocate some of those funds in a different way. Um, yeah, I, I think that it's such an amazing opportunity to invest in the community. And I'm sure it's a daunting task to work through this amount of money when there's so many things that could be, I mean, the city is always going to need money, right? There's always going to be things that could be improved. There's always going to be things that could be better for people and businesses. And I do think that there are really important ways that this can continue to be focused on those that are most impacted by the lockdowns and the loss of income and the deaths and really supporting those people the most. I, I don't want to disparage the idea that some of these things could still use funding. Of course, they, they do and they could. But maybe just the reorienting of some of these funds. And like I said, I'm sure it's complicated. I understand that like in order to get some access to some of these money, the city has to pony up money and then other monies come in. And I'm sure it's a, a big, you know, three ring circus in a lot of way for many of you to figure out what hoops you have to jump through to, to get access to any of this funding. So I think overall, I love a lot of the ideas. So thank you for your work on that. And thank you to the work of the budget committee members for on that. And I know that you all are volunteer people that you're not, you're not getting paid to do this. So I just keep it up, you know, and just maybe continue to refocus on those that just need it most. And, you know, I'm sure you're going to do the best you can, but, um, yeah, especially if we can get more of the information out there to the people so they can respond more more authentically for what they want. I think, you know, like Mish said, you know, less than 200 people out of a, you know, 30 plus thousand people population is pretty, pretty low engagement. So um, thank you, Tannen. Uh, your time is up. All right. Thank thanks. you. Yeah. 
Claudia, next. Mayor and Council, that's everyone who signed up. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, that now takes us to our next item uh, on the agenda, which is the presentation. And tonight we have the opportunity to hear the McMinnville Downtown Association, the MDA's annual uh, presentation to the council. So we'll call on uh, Executive Director uh, David Urquist to uh, present to us. David, it's good to have you on and, and uh, I see you have staff with you. <laughs> Okay, now I'm unmuted. All right, we'll get myself a big face in the middle. No, I'm here with Heather Miller, who is the uh, president of McMinnville's. Yeah, I just I just hired her for you, saying it was staff, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> well, Lee, Welcome and hour, congratulations, Heather. <laughs> the hours she puts in, she should be staff. <laughs> so Heather's going to begin tonight making the presentation, and uh, we have a slideshow to accompany it. And Heather, it's all yours. All right, um, sorry about that. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Awesome. Okay, I'm trying to get this to move so I can uh, share it, present it. Okay. All right. Well, thank you everyone, Mayor Hill and counselors for the time to share tonight. Um, we're going to kind of give a brief overview of the MDA and what we do downtown. Over the past couple of years, we've we've spent a lot of work reviewing our mission statement and also redefining kind of our values. So I'm going to go through those. This is some work that one of our committees did just to kind of help us to continue to reflect the work of the MDA and to better represent our priorities and help our board and committees to kind of continue to focus on the North Star. So our value statements, we came up with the words integrity, sustainable, communicative, welcoming, and friendly, and purposeful. And then came up with statements attached to each of those. Also want to introduce our um, MDA staff. So Executive Director Dave Recklos, and then Operations and Programs Coordinator, Chloe Dreyer. You would most likely see Chloe at the farmer's market, but she is really the person behind the scenes day in and day out at the MDA making all the little things happen. So she worked, both of our staff work incredibly hard and they accomplish really incredible things with often very limited resources. So shout out to both of them. We've also had both of them on board for almost for the second year in a row. So that's a, a really positive move for our organization as well. I also want to acknowledge our board of directors. So our executive committee is here, myself as president, vice president, Danny Chisholm, secretary, Casey Clark, treasurer, Brooke Anderson, and our directors, Ricardo Antonez, Katie Diavoy, Kate Gowell, Jerry Hunter, Peter Kircher, Chelsea Nichol, Tana Miller, and Kent Taylor. So thank you to all of them for their time and effort and knowledge and everything they put towards the MDA. Back when we last spoke to you, we told you about our 2019 Oregon Main Street review. So Oregon Main Street Association comes in and reviews our program, which is a multi-day process and helps us kind of dig into our issues and things that we're not doing well and ways that we can improve. One of the things that came out of that was to really go back and focus on the four pillars of Main Street. And those became our core committees again going into 2020 and continue to be that way um, for 2021. So those are economic vita vitality, promotion, organization, and design. So we're going to start out kind of talking through what each of those committees has been working on for the last uh, last 12 months. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dave and he's gonna kick it off with our the work from our design committee. Thanks Heather. Um, so the design committee is kind of, it's interesting for me being newer to the community because 
I've had the opportunity to work with some of the pillars of of McMinnville, the city of McMinnville, and the, the our our committee is made up of some of the most compassionate people about the downtown, and they are a guiding light to me in terms of deciding upon what our para, you know, our our focus is going to be as we move forward. This is a list of projects that we're working on or have completed this year. Um, the first one there, passageway lighting, is is talking about doing a lighting project that lights passageways from Third Street to our back city lots. And we have four buildings we're working on. In fact, we kick it off tomorrow with painting conduit and so that it'll match building. The historic landmark committee gave us approval. It was a great collaborative effort. Um, we have the Rosemary mural, which will be on the side of uh, what I refer to as the ballroom building. Um, that project will be completed in January. The artist has already done the uh, collaborative work to be able to put this together, and we're very excited about it. We had some great community donations for that. Uh, the facade grant collaboration and assistance with, uh, with MURAC. I mean, we had 18 projects downtown that were uh, put into motion because of the ability of MURAC and the city of McMinnville to make funds available to property owners downtown. And, and a number of people took care or, uh, took advantage of that. We got Ben Franklin with the art committee. They uh, they helped move him out and move him back in, but we, uh, we managed to get his glasses repaired. He looks like Ben Franklin with the normal pair of glasses now. Uh, Twinkle light repair actually started this week. Six trees were done this week already, and they are gonna be back at it tonight. So um, I think we're gonna start to see that, that magical feeling downtown again on our trees uh in the in with within the next week or so the project will be completed by the end of october um kiosk lighting and message center was a collaborative effort with visit McMinnville. we took one of our uh, our kiosks turned it into a message center uh where you have a map of the downtown and in the city and you also have uh, the ability to share current events on, on the opposite side the sidewalk art for dine out again another collaborative effort with visit McMinnville um just provides you know makes people that visit whether it be residents visitors whatever that it gives them something to look at and view and feel good about and that's been another program that i think that was expanded this year and has gone over really well and then the hanging basket replacement we do that and have been doing that for a number of years it's uh it's not an inexpensive program but it certainly brings a lot of life to downtown and i was I didn't look at them today, but I know there was a freeze last night. I'm hoping they're still surviving, but we'll be changing those out to uh, the next season here coming up. So it's it's great. The design committee is a very active committee and we get a lot of things done. Next slide is the promotions committee. Now this is a committee that you know we rely upon to help us promote things within the downtown. And that committee is now coming into its own and it's really been assisted uh, graphically as well as creatively uh, in coming up with different promotions that we can execute. Uh, right now, um, we're now executing the 12 weeks of Christmas. Uh, last year, it had a huge impact at Christmas time or the last three months of the year for our downtown retailers, many who said their sales exceeded any other time that they'd been doing business. And of course, Dine Outside and the marketing effort behind that uh, assisted again with outside help. Um, we really were able to push that up. We were on uh, Portland television a number of times. Uh, just a great you know, collaborative effort. And the messaging behind that too was people within our community giving time uh, and allowing us to uh, formulate a message that really resonated with everyone. Go ahead, Heather. All right, so I'm going to switch over to our organization committee. This is one of those committees that um, probably does a lot of the footwork, but does it all kind of behind the scenes. So prior to being president, I was involved in this committee and, you know, we spend a lot of time looking over the annual budget, reviewing our policies, looking at our yearly calendar, ensuring that our board members have all the information they need as they're coming onto the board to understand how our organization works and how to be um, most effective as a board member. And then we're constantly looking at sustainable funding 
to match the growing needs of our downtown district. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit later in the presentation as far as moving, looking forward. But as most, most of you know, we're starting to see increase in visitors to our area and um, that makes our job all the more fun, but it also increases um, just the amount of people and the amount of work that goes into keeping historic downtown McMinnville, it, the charming, perfect place that people see on the photos and want to come visit. And that's, that's a big part of this committee is helping us as a board to come up with sustainable solutions to match the needs um, with funding and resources. Um, and then our last committee is our Economic Vitality Committee. Over the past uh, two years or so of COVID, this committee has, while they've been a little bit, um, I wouldn't want, I don't want to say inactive because we've done a lot of things just not in the way we normally would to support our current businesses downtown and bring bring people downtown through our farmers market, through the UFO festival, through Dine Outside. But we've also seen just in doing our general work that we're, regardless of a pandemic, we're not seeing a huge increase in our total percentage of vacancies. We've seen some movements of businesses, um, but we've also seen an incredible amount of reinvestment in downtown. Um, the first federal building, the um, Two Dogs Tap House, that entire building, Beerly Brewing, we just had Troon open. And these are huge projects that are reinvesting in downtown. So that's a really good sign from an economic vitality standpoint, because we're not seeing some of the trends that other main streets around the state are seeing where you have businesses closing and then staying vacant and empty. Um, we still have a, a few trouble spots, although we, we have seen some activity in some of those, but overall, um, we're trending in the right direction for continuing to do, um, our, the work we're doing is, is doing what we, we expect it to do. We're, we're seeing new business, movement in business and reinvestment in our downtown core. Um, I think next we're gonna talk about a couple of fun things we did this summer that were kind of a little bit new and different. We were able to hold our annual awards. So I'm gonna let Dave talk about that little event we did. <laughs> yeah, that was um, that was really fun. I mean, we, we were very saddened by the fact that we weren't able to pull off our, our typical annual awards and banquet celebration, but we hope to get back to that early this next year. In the meantime, we still felt like we needed to recognize businesses here. You'll see your own Best COVID Pivot um, Award went to McMinnville's Public Library uh, for the way in which they turned mobile and they and they they did things that you know were creative and different. Uh, all these awards here, they all went to people that were voted by the community. This wasn't just the MDA board or the MDA membership. So all these people that received recognition, they were voted on by the community, which is great. Outstanding customer service with Third Street Books, the building improvement of Two Dogs, uh, marketing and promotion from Pura Vida, who seven day a week business in a very tough staffing environment. We went back and honored Rose Marie as volunteer of the year posthumously um, because we all recognize that her contribution to downtown over the years has been nothing short of amazing. Uh, partnership, we recognize both you guys, the city of McMinnville and Visit McMinnville, because we have achieved a lot of things together now, and uh, they keep making the downtown a better place. And then our business of the year is somebody we're very familiar with. It's Harvest Fresh, and uh, you know, they're just, they're such an anchor to our downtown and such an important element as they provide so much convenience and, uh, and good product to all the people that are working or visiting downtown. The next thing is, um, this is kind of weird. We, I got approached by the director of, the executive director of the Downtown Association asked story, and she said, how would you like to do a trade where we could give away uh, a weekend in McMinnville and you can give away a weekend in Astoria and it becomes a raffle type program. And I just thought this was really cool because it brought a lot of interest here. We had a lot of, uh, participation. It was a good fundraiser for us. 
And it's something like it just woke us up to the fact that we can do this with a lot of people. We can reach out to Hood River and Bend and all these places. And, and so this is something we, uh, we intend to continue going forward as a fundraiser and just as a great way for others to see us and for somebody in our lucky community to see others. So it was very cool. Um, the next thing that we have is our gift card sales. So, so far to date, since the first of the year, we've had nearly $30,000 in gift card sales. Now, recognize that the fourth quarter is where we, we blow up. We really ramp this thing up and we really do a lot of business. And it is something that's so beneficial to our downtown businesses, most of which participate in this as members. And, uh, so this is something that drives dollars back into our downtown. And it's, it's, uh, it's probably, it's a program we've created. We offer to our membership. We do not charge for it. It is a cost factor for us, but we feel very strongly that it is well worth the investment uh, to be able to offer both our, mostly our local citizens, the ability to purchase gift cards and and you know bring people back down to the downtown it's uh it's it's definitely a program that continues to grow and gets bigger and bigger each year heather All right thanks dave so we're going to talk about some of our kind of tried and true events now downtown we'll kick it off with our farmers market so this was um Again, a huge success. This event essentially goes on for six months every week. It's an incredible undertaking, and it's just a real benefit for our local community. Um, I'm going to highlight the most this year our Double Up Food Bucks program, which is facilitated in partnership with the Oregon's Farmers Market Fund. So this allows folks with SNAP and EBT dollars to get additional dollars. So when they come to the market, exchange their EBT funds for our tokens to use at local vendors, they get an additional $10. So we essentially match their first $10. Our first year doing the Double Up Food Bucks program was last year and we did, I think just about $2,000 in Double Up Food Bucks this year, we were able to do $10,000, which means that people in our community had an additional $10,000 to buy healthy local foods, and that $10,000 went back to those vendors at the farmer's market. So it's just a huge influx of funding to the community. And part of the reason that we were able to improve on this so much is number one, Chloe, who's our operations um, guru in the office but we were also able to get a intern through the first federal internship program so sarah joined us this summer and she was paid through first federal and she did an incredible job of helping to facilitate this program to reach the communities that benefit from this the most and i can tell you from experience sitting at the market booth and hearing just the excitement and surprise when people get those extra $10 is incredible. It's um, just a really heartwarming thing. And then to know that they're spending those those dollars on uh, local products is even, even better. So that's been a huge success in addition to our normal successful Mifflinville Thursday market. Um, this year we had record-breaking vendors. We were able to continue with our expansion into the First Baptist Church parking lot. So that's a, another incredible partnership that we have that allows our booths to be further apart, create room for social distancing. We had 91% vendor retention over last year, and we also saw 40 new vendors. So we really had a, a, a terrific year as far as interest in our market. So the last little piece I'm gonna share with you about the farmer's market is Kind of our favorite success story right now so um danny and jennifer started at the mcminnville farmers market a few years ago making jam and their handmade jam pies and this past year they opened a brick and mortar just off of third street so they're on ford between uh second and third and that's where they're doing all their production and they have a great little retail shop and now they are producing 
between 300 and 500 jars of jam a week. They're in 40 local wholesale locations and they're in 30 or in three farmers markets. So from a tiny little stand at the Miffin Bowl Farmers Market, these two have both been able to quit their real jobs and do jam making full time and opened a production and retail space in our downtown core. So we're pretty excited about them. If you haven't been in there, I highly encourage it. They have delicious baked goods and lots of fun local products in addition to their jams. All right, I'm gonna hand it back to Dave to talk about Dine Outside. Yeah, so Dine Outside, obviously, we went forward with it again for our second year. And um, and it really, really took hold this year. Uh, we expanded it by an extra block to five blocks. We uh, we increased our participation amongst restaurants, tasting rooms, and so forth from 22 to 30. And the experience just became bigger and bigger and bigger. And um, the first year, we didn't really know what to expect. So we didn't know, you know, we just put it on. Uh, this year, we were able to secure some sponsorship assistance with, in particular, the likes of U.S. Foods, who was the, the uh, specifically the head sponsor of it all, which was great. It's a national organization that does a lot of work with our downtown restaurants and, uh, and grocery folks and so forth. It was very, very cool that they could be a part of it. And this was not a hard sell to get Willamette Valley or Ecology involved. Um, it's just something that obviously it's resonating with people and it's becoming bigger and bigger. And uh, and we will be discussing, you know, later in uh, the month, what our hopes are, our intents are, whatever it may be, regarding this as something to continue with. Um, this just gives you an idea of some of the things we got. We had a Travel Oregon grant. We, we strategically did something with Visit McMinnville with this. Uh, we knew that Travel Oregon and Visit McMinnville were well acquainted with one another. And we thought, you know, what's the best way for us to present ourselves? I thought, you know what? Let's have Visit McMinnville make the application on behalf of us. And uh, because of the relationship, and it worked. It, it, it came back to us in the form of the list you see there. We have been able to fund so many things this year um, that have allowed us to expand the experiences downtown, uh, not just for dine out, but in general. Uh, as I alluded to earlier, the Twinkle Light replacement program, you see $12,000 committed there that are, uh, are matched by uh, the McMinnville Area Community Foundation and the likes of cruising McMinnville and, and actually the city's light fund, not cities, but the cooperative one with the chamber and others. There's just been a lot of great things that have come of it. The passageway lighting, um, portable stages so that we could have music on the street. Uh, the utility cart, which allowed us to haul around all those uh, sign-ins that we closed the streets down with. And I must say, I thank the city for allowing us to have those signs. Uh, they purchased some plastic ones, which made them not as heavy and, and it made it easier to be able to do the overhead banners. There's just so many things that came out of it. Um, and it's it's been just, you know, it's just been a success all the way around. I mean, hopefully all of you have been able to go down there and experience at one time or another this summer. Um, we were not rained out, so to speak, maybe one weekend, but for the most part, no smoke this year. That was good. So we were able to promote it. Uh, we had, like I said, a lot of, a lot of activity from outside media, as well as assistance inside with our social media reach. And, uh, it just turned out to be something that, you know, we're starting to make a name for ourselves with. And, uh, we were able to be recognized this past week as um, well by the Oregon Main Street Association recognized Dine Out as the um, placeholding event uh, winner uh, for this season. So that was that was really great to be recognized for our efforts. Um, you know, breaker breaking sales through the summer, the restaurants did fantastic. Retailers, those especially that really engaged in it did fantastic. Uh, yeah, we even were able to work with uh, Cruising McMinnville, which turned out to be a great event for them, and we would continue to do such. And uh, the live music and so it resonated with everyone. So it's just something that continues to be a big, big thing for us. 
And then, yes, that's me. I, I wasn't, I was, I was going to do it. Then I wasn't going to do it. And then when we set up the vendor area with booths and everything, um, I sat down on a chair and asked uh, Tana Miller at Oregon stationery. I got, I said, okay, here it is. You want to paint my head? And she did it. <laughs> anyway, we had a, a abbreviated UFO festival, but it may have been as successful as many that we've ever had. I mean, the reports back from those that are downtown were fantastic. Um, we were able to bring in uh, great income from the vendor fair. The vendors were happy. Uh, just everything in particular. It turned out to be something, maybe it wasn't a parade like it's been in the past, but we were able to pull it off. I think we did it in a safe manner. Um, and, and it turned out to be something that I think everybody kind of needed a shot in an arm up and really love to see happen again. So that was another, um, that was just another thing. It was fun. It was good for the community. I think that they were the main participants this year and I think they really enjoyed it. Heather. Yeah. So this is just sort of a review of kind of all of our ongoing efforts downtown day in and day out, clean streets, dog waste bags, tree branch monitoring, and then bugging the city, um, <laughs> supporting our businesses. So as they need help, as they need, you know, where to go from here, we try to be as open and welcoming to all of them. Kiosk upkeep and maintenance, seasonal pressure washing. Again, Dave mentioned a lot of those key partnerships and Dave spends a lot of time and he's done an incredible job of immersing himself in the community, meeting with people, showing up to meetings, being on all those Zoom calls, and that's just been incredibly beneficial for the downtown over the past two years. And then grant and funding assistance for property owners. So as we go back into um, this next year, we're gonna have another round of the OMS grant funding so that um, we've gotten some of that money in the past for the allegory brewing project and things of that nature where we can, again, bring some of that state money back to McMinnville and improve some of those buildings downtown that are, you know, aging and, and are in, in dire need of some revitalization. So we'll work through that process and hope to put an application forward that secures that funding for, for McMinnville. All right, I'm going to, I think Dave, you're, yeah, you're going to be next for the holiday promotions. I love that shot. You know, it's such a pretty shot of Third Street. It's that way. So holiday promotions, um, you know, the things like right now, if you go downtown, we have eight scarecrows there. There'll be 11 total entrants this year. Um, make sure you go down there and see it. It's very creative and, and fun to see. And I was watching people today looking at all the different scarecrows. And, you know, it's again, it's just a way to engage our local residents as well as visitors and the fun things that we do down there. Um, in addition to that, we have things like we're working on right now. We just launched this last week toward the 12 weeks or the weeks before Christmas. And uh, this is something where we're actually this year, instead of doing a raffle, we're doing a scratch off game. So if you buy $25 or more, you get the opportunity to scratch off a perhaps winning ticket. And uh, it's great. I mean, people love that kind of stuff. And, uh, and it definitely helps promote sales. One of the things I failed to mention earlier is just that the dine out in many ways, as I mentioned to Oregon Main Street, it, it reacquainted a lot of our local residents with the downtown. And that pushed itself over to our, our Christmas season. I think there's a lot of people committed to our downtown here in McMinnville. And, and it certainly shows with the type of, uh, the type of activity that took place this last uh, Christmas and what we hope to have to be the same thing this holiday season. So it's, uh, we got a lot going on. There's always a lot going on. <laughs> and uh, we'll just keep pushing it forward. Heather? All right. So we're gonna wrap up with our continued board priorities. So at the end of this month, we will have a board retreat discussing our events, primarily um, talking about the streetscape and what that means going forward for our downtown businesses, continuing our communication with stakeholders, and then the continued conversation of our evaluation of income streams and our funding streams. So I think most of you are aware, but I'm gonna go through that just briefly. Our, our three primary funding streams are the EID, 
our member business membership, which incredibly, and this is a lot thanks to Dave and Chloe, has increased throughout the pandemic. So that's been a really positive thing. And then our events and sponsorships. One thing we learned during COVID is that our events and sponsorships are not as reliable as we would like them to be. So in a lot of ways, we, we decreased that funding over the past two years, and we've really been operating and producing the same general maintenance and basic things without those very crucial funding streams. So we are going to be thinking about our membership structure, what that means, what our business membership structure looks like, and also going through our EID. So the EID has been in place since 1986. It's one of the oldest in the States, and it's been incredibly successful, as most of you know. Over that time, it's only increased one, one two, three times. So the EID doesn't increase like normal a normal taxation it's a self-assessed fee and um, it hasn't increased since 2007. so as everything else increases that doesn't increase until we have a renewal and we propose an increase um, so currently it's at 7.5 cents per square foot for our zone one which is kind of the core of downtown and then 3.75 cents for the surrounding areas um, so next year we are coming up on a renewal um, that'll be 2022 our last renewal was in 2019 um, so those will be things that we're going to be talking about as an organization because we we have to create a, a sustainable and stable funding stream to keep doing the work that we're doing um, the work is not becoming less and um, we have to make sure that we're not over committing to what we're capable of of doing with the resources that we have um, I did add in a bonus slide. Dave didn't know I did this, so he already talked about the creative placemaking for Dine Outside, but we also, with the Oregon Main Street Awards, won Best New Building for First Federal Headquarters. And for me as board president, this is a really huge signal from a large business that didn't need to build downtown and chose to keep their headquarters in downtown McMinnville. And that's a good sign. Um, a lot of times they can they could build anywhere. I mean, they they didn't have to choose to build there an entire city block where those fees are assessed. And they've just been a great partner and they see the value in their employees being downtown and keeping that an active, um, vibrant mix of business for both our local community and visitors as well. So that was a that was a good signal for us as a, a board and our leadership and moving forward. So we're just really proud of that project and excited to see what will happen in the future. So going back to Ben with his new glasses, we're open to any questions you all have. Thank you, um, Heather and Dave. Let's open it up for questions for the MDA. And if we could take the slide down, then we'd be able to see everyone. Okay. So any questions or comments from the, the council? Go ahead, Zach. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, uh, Heather Miller and Dave Ruckles for your time tonight. That was a fantastic whiz bang, shiny performance. Um, I also wanted to thank you, just the organization for being kind of the one that out of, out of the the pandemic and through the pandemic to really say yes to everything that they could to do things to get people to do things uh, and always keeping safety and health a, a priority in that um, you managed to to juggle a lot of balls and toe that line with the plum so um, we enjoyed going downtown and we enjoyed participating in all those projects and uh, never felt at risk for doing it so uh, thank you I think the, the the two kind of main ones I have are questions would be, you know, what um, what is the city either doing now and could do better to help, or what is the city uh, not doing now that that you would be the most helpful as you guys look to plan for your future, uh, and then the second question would be, I guess, what's the main goal um, main goal for the next year, and and that may be you touched on at the end there with with sort of revenue generation and a look at the EID. Um, but, but yeah, those are the kind of the two main questions I have about the organization. Heather, me, who? <laughs> um, I'll, do, 
I'll let you start. Okay. So the first question there, Zach, you know, I think that relative to the city, I, I'll say Port Blank, we have a great working relationship. I think the you guys have been very kind to us to allow us to use the City Hall garage for storage of event materials and things. Um, you know, we've, we've worked through a lot of different projects. We have good communication with all departments and all staff there. I, there's nothing I can say that is really you know, negative that way. Uh, I did mention to city manager Towery that uh, in our meeting uh, a week or two ago, I said, the biggest challenge that I, I, we face right now is that, and you're gonna see this, I think, when you get your third per, uh, quarter reports from Visit McMinnville, is that our city is really surging during the summertime with visitors from outside. And with increased traffic, comes increased maintenance need. Uh, I think that from my standpoint, you know, um, we've been working to try to keep the downtown clean and tidy and so forth. There's nothing to me more important because um, it just, it's so important that people that come here think of it almost as a Disneyland downtown. And so that's, that's the thing to me that's important is that we can always use assistance that way. And and I don't want to lean on just city staff or city resources. I, I think, you know, we're happy to navigate that on behalf of the city, but financial remuneration to help support that during the summertime is, I think would be a really important thing. Yeah, I would agree. Um, and, you know, one of our, our board is, is passionate about that McMinnville is a tourist destination. We, there's no denying that, but we all live and work here and, we're all passionate about keeping the downtown community friendly as well. And part of that is that Monday morning, it's it's clean that families can, you know, go for a walk downtown or do whatever they need to do. So it's, it's that balance of that extra work coming in that is absolutely benefiting our businesses and the economic vitality, but we're, we're also, we see the downtown as the living room for our community. And so it's important in that same that work is coming from them. We want to make sure it's not impeding with the charm of downtown that people move here and live here to enjoy. And well, then, we yeah, go ahead. Then going forward, I just think that, uh, you know, we're, it's like building blocks, right? We're just kind of stacking one on top of another, uh, ex you know, exploring new ideas and concepts and, you know, just trying to refine what we're doing. And if we come up with something that's really creative and beneficial, uh, adding it to the repertoire. But we're also being careful not to add too much. Because one thing is, you don't want to get too much on your plate and then you're not able to deliver. And that's something that I know our board is very uh, cognizant of at the moment. Other comments? Yeah, thank, well, thanks for, thanks for answering those questions and keep up the great work. Okay. Uh, Sal, go ahead. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Dave, I, I just want to uh, express my appreciation to you for coming in uh, and uh, doing a lot of different things to help solve problems downtown, more than, you know, things that I think that are part of your core job description. It seems like sometimes you're chief cook and bottle washer, at least from <laughs> hearing the reports from folks. So. I just wanted to say I appreciate that, and Heather as well. Your service to the community is so deeply appreciated. So I just I just wanted to say those two things, and uh, I appreciate the report. I appreciate all the work from the MDA. Uh, the one question I had is that, uh, you know, I think before you came on, Dave, there were some, I don't know, I guess frustrations by some of the downtown business owners with regard to the assessment. And do you feel like you've been able to soothe some of those feathers in the time that you've been here and and can you just kind of give an update on on that yeah I think, yeah and that was brought to my attention when i was hired and so the first thing i did was go around and heather actually had made up the list of significant people that may have been concerned about the mda in its direction and so the first thing i did was went out and saw those people and, and that includes oregon mutual and first federal and various property owners downtown. That's something that I think is very important. You know, the EID is made up of property owners. Uh, some of them are businesses, others, but many are just are just that, property owners. And 
So I've done a lot to try to get those people to understand what we're doing. We do a lot of outreach that way. And, you know, I use a communication platform where I send out, I call it the daily because for the first three months on the job, I, I put it out daily, but I still publish it every several times a week. And it basically gives everybody an update on what's going on downtown. And if any of you are interested, just email Dave at uh, downtownmcminnville.com and we'll get you on that list. And I'll tell you, you will be aware of everything going on down there all the time. And that'll really help you appreciate for what's going on, not just on an annual meeting, but all the time. It'll be great. Thanks, Dave. Yeah. Any other comments or discussions? Go ahead, uh, Remy. Thank you. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to, I have the answer that I have historically given, but I'd love to hear an updated answer on this. Uh, it's the question I get most asked uh, regarding the work of the MDA currently. What is the future of dine out? Heather? Well, um, <laughs> That is, the official answer is to be determined. We have our board retreat and that is, we will be evaluating all of our events, which we do every year. And that's how we, like Dave said, make sure that we're not over committing ourselves or stretching our staff too thin. So that will, uh, that will take place at the end of the month. Um, and we should be able to have an answer as to what that will look like going forward. I know that the the general consensus is that it's a great event and it's beneficial and uh, it may just have a little bit of tweaks as we move into the next year and you know moving back to kind of more normal life and we went a little longer on some weekends this this year and for some people that didn't seem to be the right answer so we're going to look at all of that and we'll we should have an answer in the winter at some point so everyone can get excited about spending the summer downtown again. Thank you, Heather and Dave. Uh, just a comment that I would have. Um, I've on and off been involved with the MDA since uh, I moved to town uh, back in 1992. And I've surely seen uh, what a group of individuals and merchants and property owners can do in a community. It's why we're known as one of the best small towns in the West Coast is because of the good work that you do. Um, number one, Heather and your board, thank you for the continued work. I see some of your board members on the call and so they're supporting you behind, but thank you for your leadership. And then Dave, you've come in with so much energy and such a welcoming personality that's bringing things together. The, the question that I would have is I, I just truly uh, give you kudos for that National Main Street recognition. That is hard to come by. That is an organization that really is across the nation and to be recognized. But the question that I would have McMinnville's always had the status as one of the best downtowns in the state of Oregon. And how, how are other downtowns doing from a downtown association? Are they struggling? Are they flourishing? Where, where, do, we, where do we sit with our partners out there? Yeah, I'll answer that. Um, so I meet periodically with the executive directors of all the Main Street communities in Oregon. Um, less so recently just because of farmers market commitments but uh, i'll be getting back into that but because we had the main street conference for oregon uh this past week we got to share a lot of things hear a lot of things know a lot of things and and what i would say is main street oregon is is doing all right okay it's not perfect everywhere by any means um we are in a very fortunate situation to have the, the lack of space or availability right now, our, our vacancy rate is so low. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we've been able to make the claim that, you know, we didn't lose a restaurant. We didn't really lose a retailer this year. We've had, again, musical chairs, but we haven't lost much, if anything. Um, and that is not always the case everywhere, right? So much of what propels us forward is that we have such stability 
and such long-term uh, involvement down there. Um, as I did that survey, we found that so many of our retailers and restaurants have been down there for 10 years or greater. Their resilience um, and their smarts too, because they, they don't sit back on their heels, they get involved, they make you know, decisions they need to make to keep going forward. It has been incredible. I think you know, one of the things that has been very difficult right now, and I'm sure you're hearing about this, is staffing issues for both retail and restaurants. Um, and that's something that I know uh, collaboratively as a stable table, we're trying to work on to try to create a program here within the community in conjunction with Chemeketa and uh, Evergreen to try and get a program put together that will allow us to train locally people to be involved in these types of positions and jobs. Um, it's, it's, it's more and more challenging. And I would say that's the biggest thing that's been impacting us lately. And I know that's the same throughout all of our downtowns. They all are feeling the same thing. So I, I, I'm going to give us an above average rate. I'm not going to give us, a, you know, the, the greatest rate, but I think we've done really well. And I think we've exceeded what some have been able to do. Obviously, everybody's circumstances are different. But uh, no, I'm really proud of the way downtown McMinnville is, has navigated its way through what has been an extremely challenging and tough situation. But, uh, and hopefully, hopefully, we're gonna get out through the other side here soon. Thank you, Dave. Well, again, Dave, Heather, and your board, thank you so very much for making the presentation. Uh, we enjoy this annual report because it gives us uh, really facts and figures and a, a, a much cleaner picture of what we inherently feel is going on downtown, but you just have filled in all of the, the, the pictures and the puzzles for us. So thank you for those efforts. And again, continued success as you're going into your Christmas season, which was a really, the holiday season is really a, a, a critical time for you guys. So again, thank you so very much. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council. Thank you, staff. Um, you're, you're a big part of this. So once again, thank you for what you do to support us. Yeah. It's all about the partnerships. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. Okay. Our next uh, item this evening is advice and informational items. And so we'll have reports from counselors on committee and board assignments. I'm going to start with Remy this evening. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the DEI committee actually meets this week, so I'll look forward to a more robust uh, report for you next week. Um, and that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Remy. Let's go to Chris next. All this button pushing to say, I have nothing for you. Thank you, Chris. Let's move to Sal. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, October 26th, Council of Governments is doing a convening on uh, regional housing issues. Uh, it's going to take place on Zoom from 11:30 to 1. Uh, we'll have representatives from the Realtors Association, um, large and small cities, and some folks from uh, a few different state government agencies. And I'm just forgetting which right now. But should be a really interesting conversation, and hopefully, we'll get some. Uh, policy push both at the legislature and some ideas to come back to uh, uh, cities for housing solutions. Thank you. Thank you, Sal. Uh, Zach? Thank you. Um, let, I'll be brief. Landscape Review Committee um, met uh, out of sequence, but met nonetheless. Uh, they reviewed a landscape plan in the industrial park, um, gave go ahead on that tree removal, as well as uh, kind of heard from a follow up to a previous application, some more information about a meeting on site. And then had, excuse me, MacPAC uh, met recent last week. And um, the whole main focus of it was sort of talking about f f just kind of starting to get down to the nitty gritty on formulating and forming our uh, MACPAC recommendation back to this group. The lens that they've created is, is will, be look very, will look very familiar to our core service lens. It'll be billed as sort of the optimal uh, mid-level base, below base, uh, and, and we've, we've established where things are now, base level, um, as, as well as then we're gonna go at what the optimal is and, 
from the committee's recommendation and then kind of fill in the middle in between there based on those and so we we went through the senior center and and came to consensus came to a decision on uh, the optimal recommendation for the senior center we came got to the library and came to the optimal recommendation on the library and spent a bulk of the meeting discussing and kind of trying to settle on what the optimal recommendation for that pool was that seems to be where most the most passions and and uh, and translatable translatably the highest costs are associated with and so we're working our way through uh, that and we'll have a few more meetings to go before that gets uh, complete and comes back to, to comes back to this group for recommendations that's all i got thank you zach let's go to adam Uh, yeah, so we got uh, we had a WICOM meeting today, a little bit out of off schedule, but uh, that's what worked for everybody in that WICOM meeting. We learned that there was a few cell phone activations of the Pulse Point app. Um, we're not aware if those citizens actually responded to deliver cardiac arrest help, but that was a positive, something that wouldn't have happened months ago before that app went live. So it's nice to see some some traction with that app. We also had some discussion about uh, kind of the, the ambulance service out in the West Valley and Grand Ron taking that over or the potential for them to take over that ASA out there and that would affect our citizens and our service levels as far as uh, they'd be responding from Grand Ron versus the West Valley and some of those 600 plus move ups we see a year with medic units. So definitely something to keep an eye on and uh, keep in the back of your head as we move forward with what our medic situation is. Um, airport commission we haven't met yet. Also listened in on uh, Amity Fire District board meeting last night as part of my fire district consolidation. Uh, just kind of homework and staying in tune with what other districts are doing and Amity's board uh, gave direction last night to explore kind of what their chief options are as their IGA with us expires if they were not to enter into a district scenario. So that's another moving part. And I believe uh, we're all supposed to meet all of us partners that are still at the table. Um, me being the representative for city council, I'll be in those meetings next month to start to move that conversation forward on the district and tax rate and standards of coverage and stuff like that. So finally starting to see some stuff there in the district, but it's definitely not moving moving fast and um, we'll see how it progresses, but I'll keep you guys updated. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Uh, Kelly? Uh, just a few items for uh, YCAP. I wanted to mention to you that uh, YCAP received funding from the Barber Foundation at the Oregon Community Foundation to help with the expansion into McMinnville. And YCAP is waiting two new state grants, which could also help with the planned ex expansion. So they're still seeking funding so they can do the remodeling and everything for the uh, youth outreach building. Uh, the other thing I just wanted to mention was you don't normally think too much about YCAP and marketing, but it's important that other people know about the services they provide and you know how you can participate with it. So <clears throat> I just wanted to mention a few of those options. Uh, at the request of the Oregon Food Bank, they created a video for uh, Safeway that will be shown to their employees as part of the Turkey Santa Bucks campaign. The video will help strengthen our partnerships and provide other meaningful thank yous to Safeway for funding the Harvest to Home and the new refrigerated truck. Uh, in addition, there's, they're working on a Raise the Barn video that has client testimonials, which will also be uh, put out so uh, people can see all that YCAP is doing. <clears throat> There's additional efforts to secure host homes that have re resulted in some inquiries. They are still looking for host homes for teenagers and people like that uh, need temporary housing to work them into full-time housing. So if you have any interest, do contact YCAP. And uh, finally, uh, they've also updated their uh, marketing information on the website and in flyers for the food bank, energy assistance, and youth outreach. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, I just have uh, two reports this evening. We met last uh, Thursday with uh, 
MWAC on transportation, and we had a, 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 a quite a lengthy discussion on federal funding updates with all of the infrastructure, federal infrastructure investment packages. You know, we're Oregon's in in line for about 1.2 billion dollars. Uh, plus or minus over the next five years to preserve and improve transportation uh, systems. And so we had uh, ODOT's uh, uh, financial, Travis Shillman, come in and, and share that, uh, you know, there are, there are uh, grant dollars that are going to be uh, available over the next five years uh, for transportation. And so we had a great discussion around that. We had discussions around the inventory of transportation needs, a lot dealing with strategic bike and pedestrian approaches. And then we had a uh, presentation uh, from um, ODOT to the ACT just to let them know what was going on. And so uh, it was a it was a two and a half hour meeting. So we had a lot of discussion, a lot of good things happening from that perspective. Uh, last Wednesday, MURAC met and we had maybe one of the, uh, it was a very focused meeting, but we talked about the first uh, Presbyterian Church's parking lot and being able to move forward and maybe uh, that would be the south west corner right across from the city uh, property that uh, we're looking at possibly uh, paving uh, with MURAC dollars, which then could be used as parking uh, when the church isn't using it and throughout the week. And so that was a good uh, discussion and uh, that was positive from that perspective. Uh, let's move over to department heads. Again, in your packets this evening, you have the crime response units, uh, August 2021 report to the council. And then we also have the McMinnville Economic Development Partnership report in your packet. So I'm gonna start with uh, Kylie first. Thank you, Mayor. I have nothing to report tonight. Thank you. Let's go with Jenny. Thank you, Mayor. I have nothing to report. Okay. Uh, Heather? Yes, yeah, so thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to share with everyone that we are working with Organic Valley. Uh, they're submitting building permits to rebuild on site, and they have several phases for that. Um, but we're working on the first phase with them. Uh, they're striving to get um, up and operational by what they call the spring flush. So I'm learning so much in McMinnville. First about grapes and the harvest, and now the spring flush with dairy. Um, but so uh, we're, as a team, we're putting, we're looking at that through a lens of expediting it so we can support them as much as possible. Thank you. Yeah, I met with uh, John Dietz this morning and we're working on what the, uh, the, the water capacity is going to be and because the building is going to be a larger footprint than initially uh, the building was. So, so that's a really positive piece of news because we've been waiting with bated breath on that. So uh, thank you for that report. Uh, Chief uh, Matt. You're still on mute, it looks like. Oh my there you goodness, go. I am so sorry. <laughs> this happened earlier today in the meeting and I apologize. Uh, real quickly, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, as you had mentioned, there's a, a council packet uh, for, regarding the council or the crime response unit's activity for August. I'd also like to add, not in there, is that they've recently, uh, they're doing some tremendous work uh, they recently solved uh, a string of business uh, construction site burglaries. So the, the work that they're doing is uh, tremendous for our community. I'd also like to add, uh, lastly, uh, just a little heads up. We have seen uh, one of our detectives uh, resigned. He's moving down to Texas. Bill Christensen has been with our department for many years and he is going down uh, to Waco uh, where his wife is uh, finishing up or going back to school for or master's degree and then uh, again De detective roadie uh, he's finishing up his last week here he is uh, going to start farming again for the family farm so i just wanted to recognize both them for their service uh, many years uh, here at the pd uh, but uh, they will be missed uh, uh, that's all i've got right now thank you thank you chief uh, let's go to jennifer 
Uh, good evening. So I do have one thing I wanted to share. Um, there are applications out for budget committee members and those will, um, the deadline was extended, um, but it will be closing on Friday, the 25th. So a week and a half ish from now. So um, if you know any friends and neighbors or anyone who's um, might be listening in who might have an interest, um, yeah, please consider submitting an application. Thanks. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, let, let's go ahead and Dave Renshaw, will you, you want to give a, a brief report? Uh, nothing from me, sir. Okay, thank you. Leland? Yes, good evening, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just a couple of items I thought I'd bring to your attention. Um, we've just started working with a um, consultant to address the Mercury TMDL that is now out that DEQ has issued to us. So we are starting to work on that. That plan has to be in place by September of 2022. So. We will start moving forward with that. And we have contacted and met with Deb Gillardi to start discussing our wastewater financial plan and to do a review of it to make sure we're still on track with our expenses and planned projects. And that Thank is you, it. Leland. Amanda? Thank you, Mayor. Nothing to report tonight. Okay, and I see that we have two individuals from the fire department, Amy and Debbie. Uh, do either one of you just want to update us? Amy? Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council. Uh, just a brief update. We have wrapped up a hiring process this week for our entry-level firefighter paramedic, and we're happy to have three individuals going into the backgrounds for full-time positions and one going into the backgrounds for the um, day car peak activity unit. Thank you for that update welcome uh, welcoming to get that back up and at least to the 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 levels that we have been at so thank you uh let's go to jeff jeff thank you mayor members of council just briefly a couple of things uh uh sort of tagging on to jennifer's announcement we do have um currently openings for the airport commission um there are two openings and we've only received two applications so far that is a deadline that's been extended so if you know folks in the community or if you're listening in and you're interested in the airport commission please check out our website uh second uh sometime the next i'm gonna say hopefully 48 hours we'll have a formal announcement about the new public works director to share with you and the organization at large Congratulations, Jeff, and thank you for or thank you for that report. Uh, that now takes us to the uh, uh, consent agenda this evening. We have four items on that. Is there any counselor that would like to have any item removed from the consent agenda? Hearing none, then uh, I'll take a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. So moved. So, second. It's been moved by Kelly and seconded by Sal. All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The consent agenda this evening uh, passes unanimously six to zero. It is now 8.13 and I will go ahead and adjourn the city council meeting. Maybe. Oh, mayor hill ahead. you you have one more agenda item again item number seven mayor sorry about that um okay i must have printed the wrong one so let me, Here, take let, let me I'll, I'll announce it for you it's a considering a request to permit a waiver <clears throat> of the oh, place uh, ordinance from mcminnville high school for october 22nd 2021 <laughs> okay and so uh do we turn that over to amanda to present actually chief scales will start us off and okay. i believe that uh, principal uh dr fast is here as well to answer any questions you may have thank you yes thank you uh mayor members of the council in your packet you'll see a request for a permit to a uh, waiver of the nose or noise ordinance uh, mcminnville high school uh through principal uh dr amy fast is requesting to host uh, uh, McMinnville High School homecoming dance on Friday, October 22nd from 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. on Baker Field. The area is an outside event venue adjacent to the high school property located uh, at on 15th Street. The homecoming dances uh, obviously are going to have some amplified music, which may likely impact the neighbor next to Baker Field. Uh, the council has the ability to uh, grant a waiver uh, and staff would recommend the granting of the waiver and then um, Mr. Towery would then present uh, Dr. Fast with uh, a memo outlining the uh, the conditions of that waiver. Uh, in past, 
uh, previous waivers, the city's requested that the applicant provide notice to the uh, affected neighbors in advance. And I've asked uh, Dr. Fast to be here should the council have any questions for her. So let's go, uh, go ahead and open that up for council members if they have any questions. Go ahead, Sal. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I don't have any questions, Dr. Fast, but I have never had an opportunity to um, express my gratitude to you for the work that you've done at the high school in terms of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and just overall your leadership and team building there. Uh, the teachers that I've spoke to speak so highly of your leadership, and I greatly appreciate it. Uh, as far as the motion in front of us, I'm enthusiastically supportive of, uh, of granting the waiver, and I'm really excited that the high school students are going to get an opportunity to participate in homecoming this year. Thank you so much, Sal. I really appreciate everyone allowing us to be here tonight. As you know, it's a monumental task uh, to provide our students with the opportunities they're used to, as well as keeping them safe throughout the year. So we really appreciate your flexibility and support. Uh, and we will do our part in going around to all the residential neighborhoods to make sure that they understand uh, that we will uh, do our part as well in being respectful uh, and turning that music off at 11 p.m. And again, we just really appreciate you allowing us uh, to be here tonight. And that means the world, honestly. So thank you. Thank you, doctor. Okay, uh, we have before us then a request to permit a waiver of noise ordinance uh, from Mc, for the McMinnville uh, High School, and that uh, being on October uh, 22nd, 2021. So any, uh, do I have a motion to approve? So moved. And a second? Second. second. It's uh, been, uh, 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 it's been, uh, the motion by Sal and Zach seconded. All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any Thank opposed? Thank you so much. Thank you, Amy. We appreciate all you've done. And what Sal indicated, feel that the, the council feels the same way across the board. We appreciate it. Special thanks job. to uh, McMinnville PD and uh, Chief Scales for their support as well. Absolutely. Mayor, okay. Mayor, I'd like to also note before she leaves that Dr. Fast is an excellent follow on Twitter. A uh, great balance of hilarity and really substantive topics. So <laughs> keep up the good tweeting, Amy. Okay. Now, I think we are to a point where I will adjourn the regular uh, city council meeting tonight at 8. 17 and so i will adjourn our regular meeting know that we have an executive session so if you would move over to that zoom we'll take care of the items in our executive committee this evening or session thanks all